Act One of The Old Bachelor by William Congreve. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. To the Right Honourable Charles, Lord Clifford of Lanesborough, etc. My Lord, it is with a great deal of pleasure that I lay hold on this first occasion which the accidents of my life have given me of writing to your lordship. For, since at the same time I write to all the world, it will be a means of publishing, what I would have everybody know, the respect and duty which I owe and pay to you. I have so much inclination to be yours that I need no other engagement. But the particular ties by which I am bound to your lordship and family have put it out of my power to make you any compliment, since all offers of myself will amount to no more than an honest acknowledgement, and only show a willingness in me to be grateful. I am very near wishing that it were not so much in my interest to be your lordship's servant, that it might be more my merit. Not that I would avoid being obliged to you, but I would have my own choice to run me into debt, that I might have it to boast I had distinguished a man to whom I would be glad to be obliged, even without the hopes of having it in my power ever to make him a return. It is impossible for me to come near your lordship in any kind and not receive some favour, and while in appearance I am only making an acknowledgement with the usual underhand dealing of the world, I am at the same time insinuating my own interest. I cannot give your lordship your due without tacking a bill of my own privileges. Tis true, if ever a man never committed a folly, he would never stand in need of a protection. But then power would have nothing to do, and good nature no occasion to show itself and where those qualities are, tis pity they should want objects to shine upon. I must confess, this is no reason why a man should do an idle thing, nor indeed any good excuse for it when done. Yet it reconciles the uses of such authority and goodness to the necessities of our folly, and is a sort of poetic logic, which at this time I would make use of to argue your lordship into a protection of this play. It is the first offence I have committed in this kind, or indeed in any kind of poetry, though not the first made public, and I therefore hope will be the more easily pardoned. But had it been acted when it was first written, more might have been said in its behalf, Ignorance of the town and stage would then have been excuses in a young writer, which now almost four years' experience will scarce allow of. Yet I must declare myself sensible to the good nature of the town in receiving this play so kindly with all its faults, which I must own were for the most part very industriously covered by the care of the players, for I think scarce a character but received all the advantage it would admit of from the justness of the action. As for the critics, my lord, I have nothing to say to or against any of them of any kind, from those who make just exceptions to those who find fault in the wrong place. I will only make this general answer in behalf of my play an answer which Epictetus advises every man to make for himself to his censurers, viz., that if they who find some faults in it were as intimate with it as I am, they would find a great many more. This is a confession which I needed not to have made, but, however, I can draw this use from it to my own advantage that I think there are no faults in it but what I do know, which, as I take it, is the first step to an amendment. Thus may I live in hopes, 
some time or other, of making the town amends. But you, my lord, I never can. Though I am ever your lordship's most obedient and most humble servant, William Congreve. To Mr. Congreve. When virtue in pursuit of fame appears and forward shoots the growth beyond the years, we timely court the rising hero's cause, and on his side the poet wisely draws, bespeaking him hereafter by applause. The days will come when we shall all receive returning interest from what now we give, instructed and supported by that praise and reputation which we strive to raise. Nature, so coy, so hardly to be wooed, flies like a mistress, but to be pursued. O oh, Congreve, boldly follow on the chase. She looks behind and wants thy strong embrace. She yields, she yields, surrenders all her charms to you, but force her gently to your arms. Such nerves, such graces in your lines appear as you were made to be her ravisher. Dryden has long extended his command by right divine, quite through the muses' land, absolute lord, and holding now from none but great Apollo his undoubted crown. That empire settled, and grown old in power, can wish for nothing but a successor, not to enlarge his limits, but maintain those provinces which he alone could gain. His eldest Witcherly, in wise retreat, thought it not worth his quiet to be great. Loose wandering etheridge in wild pleasures tossed, and foreign interests, to his hopes long lost. Poor Lee and Otway dead, Congreve appears the darling and last comfort of his years. Mayst thou live long in thy great master's smiles, and growing under him adorn these isles? But when, when part of him, be that but late, his body yielding must submit to fate, leaving his deathless works, and thee behind the natural successor of his mind, then mayst thou finish what he has begun, heir to his merit, be in fame his son. What thou hast done shows all is in thy power, and to write better only must write more. Tis something to be willing to commend, but my best praise is that I am your friend. Thomas Southern To Mr. Congreve The danger's great in these censorious days when critics are so rife to venture praise, when the infectious and ill-natured brood behold, and damn the work because tis good, and with a proud, ungenerous spirit try to pass an ostracism on poetry. But you, my friend, your worth doth safely bear above their spleen. You have no cause for fear. Like a well-mettled hawk, you took your flight quite out of reach and almost out of sight. As the strong sun in a fair summer's day you rise and drive the mists and clouds away, the owls and bats and all the birds of prey. Each line of yours, like polished steels so hard, in beauty safe, it wants no other guard. Nature herself's beholden to your dress, which, though still like, much fairer you express. Some vainly striving honour to obtain leave to the airs the traffic of their brain, like China underground the ripening where in a long time perhaps grows worth our care. But you now reap the fame so well you've sown the planter tastes his fruit to ripeness grown. 
as a fair orange tree at once is seen, big with what's ripe, yet springing still with green. So at one time my worthy friend appears with all the sap of youth and weight of years. Accept my pious love as forward zeal, which though it ruins me I can't conceal. Exposed to censure for my weak applause, I'm pleased to suffer in so just a cause. And though my offering may unworthy prove, take, as a friend, the wishes of my love. J. Marsh To Mr. Congreve, on his play called The Old Bachelor. Wit, like true gold, refined from all allay, immortal is, and never can decay. Tis in all times and languages the same, nor can an ill translation quench the flame. For, though the form and fashion don't remain the intrinsic value, still it will retain. Then let each studied scene be writ with art, and judgment sweat to form the laboured part. Each character be just, and nature seem. Without the ingredient wit, tis all but phlegm, for that's the soul which all the mass must move, and wake our passions into grief or love. But you, too bounteous, so your wit so thick we are surprised, and know not where to pick. And while with clapping we are just to you, ourselves we injure and lose something new. What mayn't we then, great youth, of the presage whose art and wit so much transcend thy age? How wilt thou shine at thy meridian height, who at thy rising gifts so vast a light? When dried and dying shall the world deceive whom we, immortal as his works, believe thou shalt succeed, the glory of the stage, adorn and entertain the coming age. Bevel Higgins Prologue intended for the old bachelor, written by the Lord Falkland. Most authors on the stage at first appear like widows' bridegrooms, full of doubt and fear. They judge, from the experience of the dame, how hard a task it is to quench her flame. And who falls short of furnishing a course up to his brawny predecessor's force, with utmost rage from her embrace's throne remains convicted as an empty drone. Thus often, to his shame, a pert beginner proves in the end a miserable sinner. As for our youngster, I am apt to doubt him, with all the vigour of his youth about him. But he, more sanguine, trusts in one and twenty, and impudently hopes he shall content you. For though his bachelor be worn and cold, he thinks the young may club to help the old, and what alone can be achieved by neither is often brought about by both together. The briskest of you all have felt alarms, finding the fair one prostitute her charms with broken sighs in her old fumbler's arms. But for our spark, he swears he'll ne'er be jealous of any rivals but young, lusty fellows. Faith, let him try his chance, and if the slave after his bragging prove a washy knave, may he be banished to some lonely den and never more have leave to dip his pen. But if he be the champion he pretends, both sexes sure will join to be his friends, for all agree when all can have their ends. And you must own him for a man of might if he holds out to please you the third night. 
Prologue, spoken by Mrs. Bracegirdle. How this vile world is changed! In former days, prologues were serious speeches before plays, grave, solemn things, as graces are to feasts where poets begged a blessing from their guests. But now, no more like suppliants we come. A play makes war, and prologue is the drum. Armed with keen satire and with pointed wit, we threaten you who do for judges sit to save our plays, or else we'll damn your pit. But for your comfort, it falls out today we've a young author and his first-born play. So, standing only on his good behaviour, he's very civil and entreats your favour. Not but the man has malice would he show it, but on my conscience he's a bashful poet. You think that strange? No matter, he'll outgrow it. Well, I'm his advocate. By me he prays you... I don't know whether I shall speak to please you. He prays... Oh, bless me, what shall I do now? Hang me if I know what he prays, or how. And twas the prettiest prologue as he wrote it. Well, the deuce take me if I haven't forgot it. Oh, Lord, for heaven's sake excuse the play, because, you know, if it be damned to-day, I shall be hanged for wanting what to say. But for my sake, then, but I'm in such confusion, I cannot stay to hear your resolution. Runs off. Dramatis Personae Hartwell, a surly old bachelor, pretending to slight women, secretly in love with Sylvia, read by Todd. Belmore, in love with Belinda, read by Jason in Canada. Vain love, capricious in his love, in love with Araminta, read by Thomas Peter. Sharper, read by Kristen Hand. Sir Joseph Whittle, read by Adrian Stevens. Captain Bluff, read by Adam Bielka. Fondle Wife, a Banker, read by Larry Wilson. Setter, a Pimp, read by Alan Mapstone. Servant to Fondle Wife, read by Elijah Fisher. Araminta, in love with vain love, read by B. L. Newman. Belinda, her cousin, an affected lady, in love with Belmore, read by Jennifer Pratt. Leticia, wife of Fondle Wife, read by Sonia. Sylvia, vain love's forsaken mistress, read by Avai. Lucy. Her Maid, read by Lisanne Lavoy. Betty, read by Lydia. Boy, read by Elijah Fisher. Footman, read by Nima. Barnaby, Servant to Fondle Wife, read by Craig Franklin. Music Master, read by Elijah Fisher. Stage Directions, read by Michael Manx. Scene, London. Act One, Scene One. Scene, The Street. Belmore and Vainlove meeting. Vainlove, and abroad so early. Good morrow, I thought a contemplated lover could no more have parted with his bed in a morning than he could have slept in it. Belmore, good morrow. Why, truth on't is, these early sallies are not usual to me, but business, as you see, sir. Showing letters. And business must be followed, or be lost. Business, and so must time, my friend, be close pursued or lost. Business is the rub of life, perverts our aim, casts off the bias, and leaves us wide and short of the intended mark. Pleasure, I guess you mean. Aye, what else has meaning? Oh, the wise will tell you. More than they believe, or understand. How have Ned... 
a wise man say more than he understands ay ay wisdom's nothing but a pretending to know and believe more than we really do you read of but one wise man and all that he knew was that he knew nothing come come leave business to idlers and wisdom to fools they have need of em wit be my faculty and pleasure my occupation and let father time shake his glass let low and earthly souls grovel till they have worked themselves six foot deep into a grave business is not my element i roll in a higher orb and dwell in castles in the air of thy own building that's thy element ned well as high a fly as you are a heavy lure may make you stoop flings a letter i marry sir i have a hawk's eye at a woman's hand there's more elegancy in the false spelling of this subscription takes up the letter than in all cicero let me see how now reads dear perfidious vain love hold hold life that's the wrong nay let's see the name sylvia how canst thou be ungrateful to that creature she's extremely pretty and loves thee entirely i have heard her breathe such raptures about thee ay or anybody that she's about no faith frank you wrong her she has been just to you that's pleasant by my troth from thee who hast had her never her affections tis true by heaven she owned it to my face and blushing like the virgin morn when it disclosed the cheat which that trusty bawd of nature night had hid confessed her soul was true to you though i by treachery had stolen the bliss so as true as turtle in imagination ned ha <laughs> ha preach this doctrine to husbands and the married women will adore thee why faith i think it will do well enough if the husband be out of the way for the wife to show her fondness and impatience of his absence by choosing a lover as like him as she can and what is unlike she may help out with her own fancy but is it not an abuse to the lover to be made a blind of as you say the abuse is to the lover not the husband for tis an argument of her great zeal towards him that she will enjoy him in effigy it must be a very superstitious country where such zeal passes for true devotion i doubt it will be damned by all our protestant husbands for flat idolatry but if you can make alderman fondlewife of your persuasion this letter will be needless what the old banker with the handsome wife ay let me see letitia oh tis a delicious morsel dear frank thou art the truest friend in the world ay am i not to be continually starting of hairs for you to course we were certainly cut out for one another for my temper quits an amour just when thine takes it up but read that it is an appointment for me this evening when fondlewife will be gone out of town to meet the master of a ship about the return of a venture which he is in danger of losing read read Belmore reads hum hum out of town this evening and talks of sending for mr spintext to keep me company but i'll take care he shall not be at home good spintext oh the fanatic one-eyed parson ay belmore reads hmm hmm that your conversation will be much more agreeable if you can counterfeit his habit to blind the servants very good then i must be disguised with all my heart it adds a gusto to an amour uh, it gives the greater resemblance of theft and among us lewd mortals the deeper the sin the sweeter frank i'm amazed at thy good nature faith i hate love when tis forced upon a man as i do wine and this business is none of my seeking i only happened to be once or twice where letitia was the handsomest woman in company so consequently applied myself to her and it seems she has taken me at my word had you been there or anybody it had been the same i wish i may succeed as the same never doubt it for if the spirit of cuckoldom be once raised up in a woman the devil can't lay it until she has done it prithee what sort of fellow is fondlewife a kind of mongrel zealot sometimes very precise and peevish but i have seen him pleasant enough in his way much addicted to jealousy but more to fondness 
so that, as he is often jealous without a cause, he is as often satisfied without reason. A very even temper, and, and fit for my purpose. I must get your man setter to provide my disguise. Ay, you may take him for good and all, if you will, for you have made him fit for nobody else. Well, you're going to visit in return of Sylvia's letter. Poor rogue! Any hour of the day or night will serve her. But do you know nothing of a new rival there? Yes, Hartwell, that surly old pretended woman-hater, thinks her virtuous. That's one reason why I fail her. I would have her fret herself out of conceit with me, that she may entertain some thoughts of him. I know he visits her every day. Yet rails on still and thinks his love unknown to us. A little time will swell him so. He must be forced to give it birth and the discovery must needs be very pleasant from himself to see what pains he will take and how he will strain to be delivered of a secret when he has miscarried of it already well good morrow let's dine together i'll meet at the old place with all my heart it lies convenient for us to pay our afternoon services to our mistresses i find i am damnably in love i'm so uneasy for not having seen belinda yesterday but I saw my Araminta, yet am as impatient. Scene two. Belmore alone. Why, what a cormorant in love am I? Who, not contented with the slavery of honourable love in one place, and the pleasure of enjoying some half a score mistresses of my own acquiring, must yet take vain love's business upon my hands, because it lay too heavy upon his? so am not only forced to lie with other men's wives for him, but must also undertake the harder task of obliging their mistresses. I must take up, or I shall never hold out. Flesh and blood cannot bear it always. Scene three. To him, Sharper. I'm sorry to see this, Ned. Once a man comes to his soliloquies, I give him for gone. Sharper, I'm glad to see thee. What? Is Belinda cruel that you are so thoughtful? No, Faith, not for that. But there's a business of consequence fallen out to-day that requires some consideration. Prithee, what mighty business of consequence canst thou have? Why, you must know, tis a piece of work toward the finishing of an alderman. It seems I must put the last hand to it and dub him cuckold that he may be of equal dignity with the rest of his brethren, so I must beg Belinda's pardon. Faith, e'en give her over for good and all. You can have no hopes of getting her for a mistress, and she is too proud, too inconstant, too affected, and too witty, and too handsome for a wife. But she can't have too much money. There's twelve thousand pound, Tom. Tis true she is excessively foppish and affected, but in my conscience I believe the baggage loves me, for she never speaks well of me herself, nor suffers anybody else to rail at me. Then, as I told you, there's twelve thousand pound. Hum! Why, Faith, upon second thoughts, she does not appear to be so very affected neither. Give her her due. I think the woman's a woman, and that's all. As such, I'm sure I shall like her, for the devil take me if I don't love all the sex. And here comes one who swears as heartily he hates all the sex. Scene four. To them, Hartwell. Who? Hartwell? Ay, but he knows better things. How now, George, where hast thou been snarling odious truths and entertaining company like a physician with discourse of their diseases and infirmities? What fine lady hast thou been putting out of conceit with herself, and persuading that the face she had been making all the morning was none of her own? For I know thou art as unmannerly and as unwelcome to a woman as a looking-glass after the smallpox. I confess I have not been sneering fulsome lies and nauseous flattery, fawning upon a little tawdry whore, that will fawn upon me again, and entertain any puppy that comes, like a tumbler, with the same tricks over and over. For such, I guess, 
may have been your late employment. Would thou hadst come a little sooner. Vain love would have wrought thy conversion, and been a champion for the cause. What? Has he been here? That's one of love's April fools. It is always upon some errand that's to no purpose, ever embarking in adventures, yet never comes to harbour. That's because he always sets out in foul weather, loves to buffet with the winds, meet the tide, and sail in the teeth of opposition. What? Has he not dropped anchor at Araminta? Truth on is she fits his temper best, is a kind of floating island, sometimes seems in reach, then vanishes and keeps him busied in the search. She had need have a good share of sense to manage so capricious a lover. Faith, I don't know, he's of a temper the most easy to himself in the world. He takes always as much of an amour as he cares for, and quits it when it grows stale or unpleasant. An argument of very little passion, very good understanding, and very ill nature. And proves that vain love plays the fool with discretion. You, Belmore, are bound in gratitude to stickle for him. You with pleasure reap that fruit which he takes pains to sow. He does the drudgery in the mine, and you stamp your image on the gold. He's of another opinion, and says I do the drudgery in the mine. Well, we have each our share of sport, and each that which he likes best. Tis his diversion to set, tis mine to cover the partridge. And it should be mine to let him go again. Not till you had mouthed a little, George. I think that's all thou art fit for now. Good, Mr. Young Fellow. You're mistaken. As able as yourself, and as nimble, too. Though I mayn't have so much mercury in my limbs. Tis true, indeed, I don't force appetite, but wait the natural call of my lust, and think it time enough to be lewd after I have had the temptation. Time enough, I. Too soon I should rather have expected from a person of your gravity. Yet it is oft times too late with one of you young to mongant flashy sinners. You have all the guilt of the intention, and none of the pleasures of practice. Tis true you are so eager in pursuit of the temptation, that you save the devil the trouble of leading you into it. Nor is it out of discretion that you don't swallow that very hook yourselves have made it, but you are cloyed with the preparative, and what you mean for a wet turns the edge of your puny stomachs. Your love is like your courage, which you show for the first year or two upon all occasions, till in a little time, being disabled or disarmed, you abate of your vigour, and that daring blade which was so often drawn is bound to the peace for ever after. Thou art an old fornicator of a singular good principle indeed, an art for encouraging youth, that they may be as wicked as thou art at thy years. I am for having everybody be what they pretend to be. A whore-master be a whore-master, and not, like vain love, kiss a lap-dog with passion, when it would disgust him from the lady's own lips. That only happens sometimes, where the dog has the sweeter breath, for the more cleanly conveyance. But, George, you must not quarrel with little gallantries of this nature. Women are often won by em. Who would refuse to kiss a lapdog if it were preliminary to the lips of his lady? Or omit playing with her fan and cooling her if she were hot, when it might entitle him to the office of warming her when she should be cold? What is it to read a play in a rainy day? Though you should be now and then interrupted in a witty scene, and she perhaps preserve her laughter till the jest were over, even that may be borne with, considering the reward in prospect. I confess you that our ladies' asses bear greater burdens. 
are forced to undergo dressing, dancing, singing, sighing, whining, rhyming, flattering, lying, grinning, cringing, and the drudgery of loving to boot. Oh, brute, the drudgery of loving. Ah, why, to come to love through all these encumbrances is like coming to an estate overcharged with debts, which, by the time you have paid, yields no further profit than what the bare tillage and manuring of the land will produce at the expense of your own sweat. Prithee, how dost thou love? He, he hates the sex. So I hate physic, too. Yet I may love to take it for my health. Well, come off, George, if at any time you should be taken straying. He has need of such an excuse, considering the present state of his body. How do you mean? Why, if whoring be purging, as you call it, then, I may say, marriage is entering into a course of physic. How, George, does the wind blow there? It will as soon blow north and by south. Mary Quotha, I hope in heaven I have a greater portion of grace, and I think I have baited too many of those traps to be caught in one myself. Who the devil would have thee? Unless twere an oyster-woman to propagate young fry for Billingsgate, <laughs> thy talent will never recommend thee to anything of better quality. My talent is chiefly that of speaking truth, which I don't expect should ever recommend me to people of quality. I thank heaven I have very honestly purchased the hatred of all the great families in town. And you, in return of spleen, hate them. But could you hope to be received into the alliance of a noble family? No, I hope I shall never merit that affliction. To be punished with a wife of birth? Be a stag of the first head and bear my horns aloft, like one of the supporters of my wife's coat? It's a death. I would not be a cuckold to ear an illustrious oar in England. What? Not to make your family man and provide for your children? For her children, you mean. Ah, there you've nicked it. There's the devil upon devil. Ah, oh, the pride and joy of heart. T'would be to me to have my son and heir resemble such a duke. To have a fleering coxcomb scoff and cry, Mister? Your son's mighty like his grace, has just his smile and air of face. Then replies another, Methinks he has more the marquess of such a place about his nose and eyes, so he has my lord, what do you call it, mouth to a tittle. Then I, to put it off as unconcerned, come chuck the infant under the chin, Force a smile and cry, I, the boy, takes after his mother's relations. When the devil and she knows, tis a little compound of the whole body of nobility. Ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha, ha. Well, but, George, I have one question to ask you. Pshaw, I have prattled away my time. I hope you are in no haste for an answer, for I shan't stay now. Looking on his watch. Nay, prithee, George. No, besides my business, I see a fool coming this way. Adieu. Scene 5. Sharper, Belmore. What does he mean? Oh, tis Sir Joseph Whittle with his friend. But I see he has turned the corner and goes another way. What in the name of wonder is it? Why, a fool. "'Tis a tawdry outside. "'And a very beggarly lining. "'Yet he may be worth your acquaintance. "'A little of thy chemistry, Tom, "'may extract gold from that dirt. "'Say you so? "'Faith I am as poor as a chemist, "'and would be as industrious. "'But what was he that followed him? "'Is not he a dragon that watches those golden pippins? "'Hang him, no. "'He a dragon?' If he be, tis a very peaceful one. 
I can ensure his anger dormant, or should he seem to rouse, tis but well lashing him, and he will sleep like a top. Aye, is he of that kidney? Yet is adored by that bigot, Sir Joseph Whittle, as the image of valour. He calls him his back, and indeed they are never asunder. Yet last night I know not by what mischance the knight was alone and had fallen into the hands of some night-walkers, who, I suppose, would have pillaged him. But I chanced to come by and rescued him, though I believe he was heartily frightened, for as soon as ever he was loose he ran away without staying to see who had helped him. Is that bully of his in the army? No, but is a pretender, and wears the habit of a soldier, which nowadays as often cloaks cowardice as a black gown does atheism. You must know he has been abroad, went purely to run away from a campaign, enriched himself with the plunder of a few oaths, and here vents them against the general, who, slighting men of merit and preferring only those of interest, has made him quit the service wherein no doubt he magnifies his own performance. Speaks miracles is the drum to his own praise. The only implement of a soldier he resembles like that, being full of blustering noise and emptiness. And like that, of no use but to be beaten. Right. But then the comparison breaks, for he will take a drubbing with as little noise as a pulpit cushion. His name and I have done? Why, that, to pass it current, too, he has gilded with a title. He is called Captain Bluff. Well, I'll endeavour his acquaintance. You steer another course, are bound for Love's Island, I for the Golden Coast. May each succeed in what he wishes most. End of Act One Act Two of The Old Bachelor by William Congreve. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two, Scene One. Sir Joseph Whittle, Sharper following. Sure, that's he, and alone. Um, hey, this, this is the very damn place. The inhuman cannibals, the bloody-minded villains, would have butchered me last night. No doubt they would have laid me alive, have sold my skin and devoured, etc. How's this? And it hadn't been for a civil gentleman as came by and frightened him away, but I gad, I durst not stay to give him thanks. This must be Belmore, he means. Ha! I have a thought. Zooks! Would the captain would come! The very remembrance makes me quake. Agad, I shall never be reconciled to this place heartily. Tis but trying, and being where I am at worst, now luck. Cursed fortune. This must be the place, this damned unlucky place. Agad, and so tis. Why, he has been more mischief done, I perceive. No, tis gone, tis lost. Ten thousand devils on that chance which drew me hither. I here, just here, this spot to me is hell. Nothing to be found but the despair of what I've lost. Looking about as if in search. Poor gentleman! By the Lord Harry, I'll stay no longer, for I have found two. Ha! Who's that has found? What have you found? Restore it quickly, or by... Not I, sir, not I. As I have a soul to be saved, I have found nothing but what has been to my loss, as I may say. And as you were saying, sir? Oh, your servant, sir. You are safe, then, it seems. Tis an ill wind that blows nobody good. Well, you may rejoice over my ill fortune, since it paid the price of your ransom. I rejoice, agad, not I, sir. I am very sorry for your loss, with all my heart, blood, and guts, sir. And if you did but know me, you'd ne'er say I were so ill-natured. Know you? Why, can you be so ungrateful to forget me? Oh, Lord, forget him? No, no, sir, I don't forget you, because I never saw your face before, a Ha, 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 ha! Sharper, angrily. How? Stay, stay, sir, let me recollect. Aside. 
He's a damned angry fellow. I believe I had better remember him until I can get out of his sight. But out of sight, out of mind, I get. Methought the service I did you last night, sir, in preserving you from those ruffians, might have taken better root in your shallow memory. Sir Joseph Whittle, aside. Gad, staggers, belts, blades, and scabbards. This is the very gentleman. How shall I make him a return suitable to the greatness of his merit? I had a pretty thing to that purpose, if he hadn't frightened it out of my memory. Hem, hem, sir, I most submissively employ your pardon for my transgression of ingratitude and omission, having my entire dependence, sir, upon the superfluity of your goodness, which, like an inundation, will, I hope, totally emerge the recollection of my error, and leave me floating in your sight upon the full-blown bladders of repentance, by the help of which I shall once more hope to swim into your favour. Bows. So, oh, sir, I am easily pacified. The acknowledgement of a gentleman. Acknowledgement? Sir, I am all over acknowledgement. Will not stick to show it in the greatest extremity by night or day. In sickness or in health, winter or summer, all seasons and occasions shall testify the reality and gratitude of your superabundant humble servant, Sir Joseph Whittle, Knight. Hem, hem. Sir Joseph Whittle? The same, sir, of Whittle Hall in Comitatu Bucks. Is it possible that I am happy to have obliged the mirror of knighthood and the pink of courtesy in the age? Let me embrace you. Oh, Lord, sir! My loss I esteem as a trifle repaid with interest, since it has purchased me the friendship and acquaintance of the person in the world whose character I admire. You are only pleased to say so, sir, but... Pray, if I may be so bold, what is that loss you mention? Oh, term it no longer so, sir. In the scuffle last night I only dropped a bill of a hundred pound, which I confess I came half despairing to recover. But thanks to my better fortune... You have found it, sir, then, it seems. I profess I am heartily glad. Sir, your humble servant, I don't question but you are, that you have so cheap an opportunity of expressing your gratitude and generosity since the paying so trivial a sum will wholly acquit you and doubly engage me. Sir Joseph, aside. What a dickens does he mean by a trivial sum? But hadn't you found it, sir? No otherwise, I vow to gad, but in my hopes in you, sir. Tiff. But that's sufficient. T'were injustice to doubt the honour of Sir Joseph Whittle. Oh, Lord, sir. You are above, I'm sure, a thought so low to suffer me to lose what was ventured in your service. Nay, t'was in a matter paid down for your deliverance, t'was so much lent to you. And you scorn, I'll say that for you. Nay, I'll say that for myself with your leaf, sir. I do scorn a dirty thing, but I can't. I'm a little out of pocket at present. Pshaw, you can't want a hundred pound. Your word is sufficient anywhere. Tis but borrowing so much dirt. You have large acres and can soon repay it. Money is but dirt, Sir Joseph, mere dirt. But I profess, tis a dirt I have washed my hands of at present. I have laid it all out upon my back. Are you so extravagant in clothes, Sir Joseph? Ha, 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 ha. A very good jest, I profess. <laughs> a very good jest. And I did not know that I had said it, and that's a better jest than t'other. Tis a sign you and I han't been long acquainted. You have lost a good jest for want of knowing me. I only mean a friend of mine whom I call my back. He sticks as close to me and follows me through all danger. He is indeed back, breast and headpiece, as it were, to me. Agad, he's a brave fellow. Ah, I'm quite another thing when I'm with him. I don't fear the devil, bless us, almost as if he be by. Ah, had he been with me last night? If he had, sir, what then? He could have done no more, nor perhaps have suffered so much. Angrily. Had he a hundred pound to lose? Oh, Lord, sir, by no means. But I might have saved a hundred pound. I meant innocently, as I hoped to be saved, sir. A damned hot fellow. Only, as I was saying, I let him have all my ready money to redeem his great sword from limbo. But, sir, I have a letter of credit to Alderman Fondlewife as far as two hundred pound. And this afternoon you shall see I am a person, such a one as you would wish to have met with. Sharper, 
aside. That you are, I'll be sworn. Why, that's great and like yourself. Scene two. To them, Captain Bluff. Oh, here it comes. I, my Hector of Troy, welcome my bully, my back, Agad. My heart has gone a pit-pat for thee. How now, my young knight? Not for fear, I hope. He that knows me must be a stranger to fear. Nay, Agad, I hate fear ever since I had like to have died of a fright. But... But? Look here, boy. Here's your antidote. Here's your Jesuit's powder for a shaking fit. But who hast thou got with thee? Is he of metal? Laying his hand upon his sword. Aye, bully, a devilish smart fellow, who will fight like a cock. Say you so? Then I honour him. But has he been abroad? For every cock will fight upon his own dunghill. I don't know, but I'll present you. I'll recommend myself. Sir, I honour you. I understand you love fighting. I reverence a man that loves fighting. Sir, I kiss your hilts. Sir, your servant, but you are misinformed, for unless it be to serve my particular friend as Sir Joseph here, my country, or my religion, or in some very justifiable cause, I'm not for it. O oh Lord, I beg your pardon, sir. I find you are not of my palate. You can't relish a dish of fighting without sweet sauce. Now I think fighting for fighting's sake sufficient cause. Fighting to me is religion and the laws. Ah, well said, my hero. Was not that great, sir? By the Lord Harry, he says true. Fighting is meat, drink, and cloth to him. But back, this gentleman is one of the best friends I have in the world, and saved my life last night. You know I told you. Aye, then I honour him again. Sir, may I crave your name? Aye, sir, my name's Sharper. Pray, Mr. Sharper, embrace my back. Very well. By the Lord Harry, Mr. Sharper, he's as brave a fellow as Cannibal, are you not, Bullyback? Hannibal, I believe you mean Sir Joseph. Undoubtedly he did, sir. Faith, Hannibal was a pretty fellow, but Sir Joseph, comparisons are odious. Hannibal was a very pretty fellow in those days, it must be granted. But alas, sir, were he alive now, he would be nothing, nothing in the earth. How, sir? I make a doubt if there be at this day a greater general breathing. Oh, excuse me, sir. Have you served abroad, sir? Not I, really, sir. Oh, I thought so. Why, then? You can know nothing, sir. I am afraid you scarce know the history of the late war in Flanders, with all its particulars. Not I, sir. No more than public letters or gazettes tell us. Gazette? Why there again now? Why, sir, there are not three words of truth the year round put into the gazette. I'll tell you a strange thing now as to that. You must know, sir, I was a resident in Flanders the last campaign, and had a small post there. But no matter for that. Perhaps, sir, there was scarce anything of moment done but a humble servant of yours that shall be nameless was an eyewitness of. I won't say had the greatest share in it. Though I might say that, too, since I name nobody you know. Well, Mr. Sharper, would you think it? In all this time, as I hope for a truncheon, this rascally gazette writer never so much as once mentioned me, not once by the wars, took no more notice than if Noel Bluff had not been in the land of the living. Strange. Yet, by the Lord Harry, tis true, Mr. Sharper, for I went every day to coffee houses to read the Gazette myself. Aye, aye, no matter. You see, Mr. Sharper, after all, I am content to retire. Live a private person. Scipio and others have done it. Sharper, aside. Impudent rogue. Ay, this damned monastery of yours. Agad, if he would put in foot, he might make general himself yet. Oh, fie. No, Sir Joseph, you know I hate this. Let me but tell Mr. Sharper a little how you ate fire once out of the mouth of a cannon. Agad, he did. Those impenetrable whiskers of his have confronted flames. Death? What do you mean, Sir Joseph? Look, you know, I tell you, he's so modest he'll own nothing. Pish! You have put me out. I have forgot what I was about. Angrily. Pray, hold your tongue and give me leave. I am dumb. This sword I think I was telling you of, Mr. Sharper. This sword I'll maintain to be the best divine, anatomist, lawyer, or casuist in Europe. 
it shall decide a controversy or split a cause. Nay, now I must speak. It will split a hair by the Lord Harry. I have seen it. Zounds, sir, it's a lie. You have not seen it, nor shan't see it. Sir, I say you can't see. What do you say to that now? I am blind. Death, had any other man interrupted me. Good Mr. Sharper, speak to him. I dare not look that way. Captain, Sir Joseph's penitent. Oh, I am calm, sir. Calm as a discharged culverin. But twas indiscreet when you know what will provoke me. Nay, come, Sir Joseph, you know my heat's soon over. Well, I'm a fool sometimes, but I'm sorry. Enough. Come, we'll go take a glass to drown animosities. Mr. Sharper, will you partake? I wait on you, sir. Nay, pray, Captain, you are Sir Joseph's back. Scene 3 Araminta, Belinda, Betty, waiting in Araminta's apartment. Ah, oh, nay, dear, prithee, good, dear, sweet cousin, no more. Oh, gad, I swear you make one sick to hear you. Bless me. What have I said to move you thus? Oh, you have raved, talked idly, and all in commendation of that filthy, awkward, two-legged creature, man. You don't know what you've said. Your fever has transported you. If love be the fever which you mean, kind heaven avert the cure. Let me have oil to feed that flame, and never let it be extinct till I myself am ashes. There was a wine. Oh, gad, I hate your horrid fancy. This love is the devil, and sure, to be in love is to be possessed. Tis in the heart, the head, the blood, the... all over. Oh, gad, you are quite spoiled. I shall loathe the sight of mankind for your sake. Fee, this is gross affectation. A little of Belmore's company would change the scene. Filthy fellow, I wonder, cousin. I wonder, cousin. You should imagine I don't perceive you love him. Oh, I love your hideous fancy. Ha ha ha, love a man. Love a man, yes. You would not love a beast. Of all beasts, not an ass, which is so like your vain love. Lard, I have seen an ass look so chagrin. Ha, 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 you must pardon me, I can't help laughing. <laughs> that an absolute lover would have concluded the poor creature to have had darts and flames and altars and all that in his breast. Araminta, come. I'll talk seriously to you now. Could you but see with my eyes the buffoonery of one scene of address, a lover, set out with all his equipage and appurtenances, Oh, gad, I sure you would, but you play the game, and consequently can't see the miscarriages obvious to every stander by. Yes, yes, I can see something near it when you and Belmore meet. You don't know that you dreamt of Belmore last night, and called him aloud in your sleep. Pish, I can't help dreaming of the devil sometimes. Would you from thence infer I love him? But that's not all. You caught me in your arms when you named him, and pressed me to your bosom. Sure, if I had not pinched you until you waked, you had stifled me with kisses. Oh, barbarous aspersion! No aspersion, cousin. We are alone. Nay, I can tell you more. I deny it all. What? Before you hear it? My denial is premeditated, like your malice. Lard, cousin, you talk oddly. Whatever the matter is, oh my soul, I'm afraid you'll follow evil courses. Ha ha ha, this is pleasant. You may laugh, but... Ha ha ha. You think that malicious grin becomes you. The devil take Belmore. Why do you tell me of him? Oh, is it come out? Now you are angry, I am sure you love him. I tell nobody else, cousin. I have not betrayed you yet. Prithee, tell it all the world. It's false. Come then, kiss and friends. Pish. Prithee, don't be so peevish. Prithee, don't be so impertinent. Betty. Ha ha ha. Did your ladyship call, madam? Get my hoods and tippet, and bid the footman call a chair. I hope you are not going out in Dutch and cousin. Scene four. To them, footman. Madam, there are... Is there a chair? No, madam. There are Mr. Belmore and Mr. Vainlove to wait upon your ladyship. Are they below? No, madam. 
they sent before to know if you were at home the visits to you cousin i suppose i am at my liberty be ready to show him up scene five to them betty with hoods and looking glass i can't tell cousin i believe we are equally concerned but if you continue your humor it won't be very entertaining aside i know she'd feign to be persuaded to stay i shall oblige you in leaving you to the full and free enjoyment of that conversation you admire let me see hold the glass lord i look wretchedly today betty why don't you help my cousin putting on her hoods hold off your fists and see that he gets a chair with a high roof or a very low seat stay come back here you mrs fidget you are so ready to go to the footman here take them all again my mind's changed i won't go scene six araminta belinda so this i expected you won't oblige me then cousin and let me have all the company to myself no upon deliberation i have too much charity to trust you to yourself the devil watches all opportunities and in this favourable disposition of your mind heaven knows how far you may be tempted i am tender of your reputation i am obliged to you but who's malicious now belinda not i witness my heart i stay out of pure affection in my conscience i believe you scene seven to them vainlove belmore footman so fortune be praised to find you both within ladies is no miracle i hope not o your side madam i confess but my tyrant there and i are two buckets that can never come together nor are ever like yet we often meet and clash how never like mary hymen forbid but this it is to run so extravagantly in debt i have laid out such a world of love in your service that you think you can never be able to pay me all so shun me for the same reason that you would have done i on my conscience and the most impertinent and troublesome of duns a dun for money will be quiet when he sees his debtor has not wherewithal but a dun for love is an eternal torment that never rests until he has created love where there was none and then gets it for his pains for importunity in love like importunity at court first creates its own interest and then pursues it for the favour favours that are got by impudence and importunity are like discoveries from the rack when the afflicted person for his ease sometimes confesses secrets his heart knows nothing of i should rather think favours so gained to be due rewards to indefatigable devotion for his love is a deity he must be served by prayer oh gad would you would all pray to love then and let us alone you are the temples of love and tis through you our devotion must be conveyed rather poor silly idols of your own making which upon the least displeasure you forsake and set up new every man now changes his mistress and his religion as his humour varies or his interest oh madam nay come i find we are growing serious and then we are in great danger of being dull if my music-master be not gone i'll entertain you with a new song which comes pretty near my own opinion of love and your sex calls who's there is mr gavot gone only to the next door madam i'll call him scene eight araminta belinda vainlove and belmore why you won't hear me with patience what's the matter cousin nothing madam only prithee hold thy tongue lad he has so pestered me with flames and stuff i think i shan't endure the sight of a fire this twelvemonth yet all can't melt that cruel frozen heart oh gad i hate your hideous fancy you said that once before if you must talk impertinently for heaven's sake let it be with variety don't come always like the devil wrapped in flames i'll not hear a sentence more that begins with an i burn or an i beseech you madam but tell me how you would be adored i am very tractable then no i would be adored in silence <laughs> i thought so that you might have all the talk to yourself you had better let me speak 
for if my thoughts fly to any pitch, I shall make villainous signs. What will you get by that to make such signs as I won't understand? Ay, but if I'm tongue-tied, I must have all my actions free to quicken your apprehension. And I, God, let me tell you, my most prevailing argument is expressed in dumb show. Scene 9. To them, Music Master. Oh, I am glad we shall have a song to divert the discourse. Pray, oblige us with the last new song. Song. Thus to a ripe consenting maid, poor old repenting Delia said, Would you long preserve your lover? Would you still his goddess reign? Never let him all discover, never let him much obtain. 2. Men will admire, adore, and die, while wishing at your feet they lie, but emitting their embraces, walks him from the golden dream. Nothing's new besides their faces. Every woman is the same. So, how do you like the song, gentlemen? Oh, very well performed, but I don't much admire the words. I expected it. There's too much truth in them. If Mr. Gaveau will walk with us in the garden, we'll have it once again. You may like it better at second hearing. You'll bring my cousin. Faith, madam, I dare not speak to her, but I'll make signs. Addresses Belinda in dumb show. Oh, foe, your dumb rhetoric is more ridiculous than your talking impertinence. As an ape is a much more troublesome animal than a parrot. Aye, cousin, and tis a sign the creatures mimic nature well. For there are few men but do more silly things than they say. Well, I find my apishness has paid the ransom for my speech and set it at liberty, Though, I confess, I could be well enough pleased to drive on a love-bargain in that silent manner. T'would save a man a world of lying and swearing at the year's end. Besides, I have had a little experience. That brings to mind, when wit and reason both have failed to move, kind looks and actions from success do prove. Even silence may be eloquent in love. End of Act Two. Act Three of The Old Bachelor by William Congreve. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three, Scene One. Scene The Street. Sylvia and Lucy. Will he not come then? Yes, yes, come. I warrant him. If you will go in and be ready to receive him. Why did you not tell me? Whom mean you? Whom you should mean. Hartwell. Senseless creature, I meant my vain love. You may as soon hope to recover your own maidenhood as his love. Therefore... E'en set your heart at rest, and in the name of opportunity, mind your own business. Strike Hartwell home, before the bait's worn off the hook. Age will come. He nibbled fairly yesterday, and no doubt will be eager enough today to swallow the temptation. Well, since there's no remedy, yet tell me, for I would know, though to the anguish of my soul, how did he refuse? Tell me, how did he receive my letter? In anger or in scorn? Neither, but what was ten times worse, with damned, senseless indifference. By this light I could have spit in his face. Receive it. Why, he received it as I would one of your lovers that should come empty-handed, as a court lord does his mercer's bill, or a begging dedication. He received it as if it had been a letter from his wife. What? Did he not read it? Hummed over it, gave you his respects, and said he would take time to peruse it. But then he was in haste. Respects and peruse it. Uh, he's gone, and Araminta has bewitched him from me. Oh, how the name of rival fires my blood. I could curse him both. Eternal jealousy attend her love, and disappointment meet his. 
oh that i could revenge the torment he has caused methinks i feel the woman strong within me and vengeance kindles in the room of love i have that in my head may make mischief how dear lucy you know araminta's dissembled coyness as one and keeps him hers could we persuade him that she loves another no you're out could we persuade him that she dotes on him himself contrive a kind letter as from her twould disgust his nicety and take away his stomach impossible twill never take trouble not your head let me alone i will inform myself of what passed between em to-day and about it straight hold i'm mistaken or that's hartwell who stands talking at the corner tis he go get you in madam receive him pleasantly dress up your face in innocence and smiles and dissemble the very want of dissimulation you know what will take him tis as hard to counterfeit love as it is to conceal it but i'll do my weak endeavour though i fear i have not art hang art madam and trust to nature for dissembling man was by nature woman's cully made we never are but by ourselves betrayed scene two hartwell vain love and belmore following hist hist is that not hartwell going to sylvia he's talking to himself i think pretty let's try if we can hear him why whither in the devil's name am i a-going now hmm let me think is not this sylvia's house the cave of that enchantress and which consequently i ought to shun as i would infection to enter here is to put on the envenomed shirt to run into the embraces of a fever and in some raving fit to be led to plunge myself into that more consuming fire a woman's arms ah <sighs> well recollected i will recover my reason and be gone now venus forbid hush well why do you not move feet do your office not one inch no forget i'm caught there stands my north and thither my needle points now oh, could i curse myself yet cannot repent oh thou delicious damned dear destructive woman so death how the young fellows will hoot me i shall be the jest of the town nay in two days i expect to be chronicled in ditty and sung in woeful ballad to the tune of the superannuated maiden's comfort or the bachelor's fall and upon the third i shall be hanged in effigy pasted up for the exemplary ornament of necessary houses and cobbler's stalls death i can't think on it i'll run into the danger to lose the apprehension scene three belmore vainlove a very certain remedy probatum est ha 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 poor george thou art in the right thou hast sold thyself to laughter the ill-natured town will find the jest just where thou hast lost it ha ha how a struggled like an old lawyer between two fees or a young wench between pleasure and reputation or as you did to-day when half afraid you snatched a kiss from araminta she has made a quarrel on t pa women are only angry at such offences to have the pleasure of forgiving them and i love to have the pleasure of making my peace i should not esteem a pardon if too easily won thou dost not know what thou wouldst be at whether thou wouldst have her angry or pleased couldst thou be content to marry araminta could you be content to go to heaven hm not immediately in my conscience not heartily i'd do a little more good in my generation first in order to deserve it 
nor I to marry Araminta till I merit her. But how the devil dost thou expect to get her if she never yield? That's true, but I would— Marry her without her consent. Thou art a riddle beyond woman. Scene four. To them, Setter. Trusty Setter, what tidings? How goes the project? As all lewd projects do, sir, where the devil prevents our endeavours with success. A good hearing, Setter. Well, I leave you with your engineer. And hast thou provided necessaries? All, all, sir. The large sanctified act and the little precise band with a swinging long spiritual cloak to cover carnal knavery, not forgetting the black patch which tribulation spintex wears, as I'm informed, upon one eye as a penal mourning for the ogling offences of his youth and some say with that eye he first discovered the frailty of his wife well in this fanatic father's habit i will confess letitia rather prepare her for confession sir by helping her to sin be at your master's lodging in the evening i shall use the robes scene five set her alone i shall sir i wonder to which of these two gentlemen i do most properly appertain the one uses me as his attendant the other being better acquainted with my parts employs me as a pimp why that's much the more honourable employment by all means i follow one as my master the other follows me as his conductor Scene six. To him, Lucy. There's the hang dog, his man. I had a power over him in the reign of my mistress, but he is too true a valet de chambre not to affect his master's faults, and consequently is revolted from his allegiance. Undoubtedly, tis impossible to be a pimp and not a man of parts. That is, without being politic, diligent, secret, wary, and so forth, and to all this valiant as Hercules, that is, passively valiant and actively obedient. Ah, Setter, what a treasure is here lost for want of being known. Here's some villainy afoot. He's so thoughtful. Maybe I may discover something in my mask. Worthy sir, a word with you. Puts on her mask. Why, if I were known, I might come to be a great man. Not to interrupt your meditation. And I should not be the first that has procured his greatness by pimping. Now, poverty and the pox light upon thee for a contemplative pimp. Oh, why are thou who thus maliciously has awakened me from my dreams of glory? Speak, thou vile disturber. Oh, thy most vile cogitations, thou poor conceited wretch. How wert thou valuing thyself upon thy master's employment? For he's the head pimp to Mr. Belmar. Good words, damsel, or I shall... But how dost thou know my master or me? Yes, I know both master and man to be. To be men, perhaps? Nay, faith-like enough. I often march in the rear of my master, and enter the breaches which he has made. Ay, the breach of faith, which he has begun, thou traitor to thy lawful princess. Why, how now? Prithee who art? Lay by that worldly face, and produce your natural visor. No, sirrah, I'll keep it on to abuse thee, and leave thee without hopes of revenge. Oh, I begin to smoke you. Thou art some forsaken Abigail we have dallied with heretofore, and art come to tickle thy imagination with remembrance of iniquity past. 
No, thou pitiful flatterer of thy master's imperfections, thou mockin, made up of the shreds and parings of his superfluous fopperies. Thou art my mistress's foul self, composed of her sullen iniquities and clothing. Hang thee, beggar's cur. Thy master is but a mumper in love, lies canting at the gate, but never dares presume to enter the house. Thou art the wicket to thy mistress's gate, to be open to all comers. In fine, thou art the high road to thy mistress. Beast, filthy toad, I can hold no longer. Look and tremble. Unmasks. How, oh, Mrs. Lucy? I wonder thou hast the impudence to look me in the face. Adds, but who's in fault, mistress of mine? Who flung the first stone? Who undervalued my function? And who the devil could know you by instinct? You could know my office by instinct, and be hanged, which you have slandered most abominably. It vexes me not what you said about my person, but that my innocent calling should be exposed and scandalized, I cannot bear it. Nay, faith, Lucy, I'm sorry. I'll own myself to blame, though we were both in fault as to our offices. Come, I'll make you any reparation. Swear. I do swear to the utmost of my power. To be brief, then, what is the reason your master did not appear today according to the summons I brought him? To answer you as briefly, he has a cause to be tried in another court. Come, tell me in plain terms how forward he is with Araminta. Too forward to be turned back although he's a little in disgrace at present about a kiss which he forced. You and I can kiss, Lucy, without all that. Stand off. He's a precious jewel. And therefore you'd have him to set in your lady's locket. Where is he now? He'll be in the piazza presently. Remember today's behaviour. Let me see you with a penitent face. What? No token of amity, Lucy. You and I don't used to part with dry lips. No, no, Avant. I'll not be slabbered and kissed now. I'm not in the humour. I'll not quit you so. I'll follow and put you into the humour. Scene 7. Sir Joseph Whittle. Bluff. And so, out of your unwanted generosity... And good nature back. I am good natured. I can't help it. You have given him a note upon Fondlewife for a hundred pound. Aye, aye, poor fellow. He ventured fair thought. You have disobliged me in it, for I have occasion for the money, and if you would look me in the face again and live, go and force him to re deliver you the note. Go and bring it to me hither. I'll stay here for you. You may stay until the day of judgment, then, by the Lord Harry. I know better things than to be run through the guts for a hundred pounds. Why, I gave that hundred pound for being saved. And do you think, and there were no danger? I'd be so ungrateful to take it from the gentleman again. Well, go to him for me. Tell him, I say, he must refund, or bilbles the world, and slaughter will ensue. If he refuse, tell him, but whisper that, tell him, I'll pink his soul, but whisper that softly to him. So softly that he shall never hear on I warrant you. Why, what's a devil's the matter, bully? Are you mad, or do you think I'm mad? A gad, for my part, I don't love to be the messenger of ill news. Tis an ungrateful office, so tell him yourself. By these hilts I believe he frightened you into this composition. I believe you gave it to him out of fear. Pure, paltry fear. Confess. No, no, Hank. I was not afraid, neither. Though I confess he did in a manner snap me up. 
Yet I can't say that it was altogether out of fear, but partly to prevent mischief, for he was a devilish choleric fellow, and if my collar had been up to head, there would have been mischief done, that's flat. And yet I believe if you had been by, I would as sooner let him had a hundred of my teeth. Ed's heart, if he should come just now when I'm angry, I'll tell him, Mum. Scene 8. To them, Belmore Sharper. Thou art a lucky rogue. There's your benefactor. You ought to return him thanks now you have received the favour. Sir Joseph, your note was accepted, and the money paid at sight. I'm come to return my thanks. It won't be accepted so readily as the bill, sir. I doubt the knight repents, Tom. He looks like the knight of the sorrowful face. This is a double generosity. Do me a kindness and refuse my thanks. But I hope you are not offended that I offered them. Maybe I am, sir. Maybe I'm not, sir. Maybe I am both, sir. What then? I hope I may be offended without any offence to you, sir. Heyday. Captain, what's the matter? You can tell. Mr. Sharper, the matter is plain. Sir Joseph has found out your trick, and does not care to be put upon, being a man of honour. Trick, sir? Aye, trick, sir, and won't be put upon, sir, being a man of honour, sir, and so, sir. Hark ye, Sir Joseph, a word with ye. In consideration of some favours lately received, I would not have you draw yourself into a premunier by trusting to that sign of a man there. That pot-gun charged with wind. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, Captain, come justify yourself. I'll give him the lie if you'll stand to it. Nay, then, I'll be beforehand with you. Take that oath. Cuffs him. Captain, will you see this? Won't you pink his soul? Hush, tis not so convenient now. I shall find a time. What do you mutter about a time, rascal? You were the incendiary. There's to put you in mind of your time. A memorandum. Kicks him. Oh, this is your time, sir. You had best make use on it. I, gad, and so I will. There's again for you. Kicks him. You are obliging, sir, but this is too public a place to thank you in. But in your ear, you are to be seen again. I, thou inimitable coward, and to be felt, as for example. Kicks him. Ha, ha, ha! Prithee come away. Tis scandalous to kick this puppy unless a man were cold and had no other way to get himself a heat. Scene 9. Sir Joseph Bluff. Very well, very fine. But tis no matter. Is not this fine, Sir Joseph? Indifferent, a cat, in my opinion. Very indifferent. I'd rather go plain all my life than wear such finery. Death and hell to be affronted thus. I'll die before I suffer it. Draws. Oh, Lord, his anger was not raised before. Nay, dear Captain, don't be in passion now he's gone. Put up, put up, dear back. Tis your Sir Joseph begs. Come, let me kiss thee so, so. Put up, put up. By heaven, tis not to be put up. What, bully? The affront. No, Agad, no more tis. For that's put up all already. Thy sword, I mean. Well, Sir Joseph, at your entreaty. Putting up his sword. But were not you, my friend, abused and cuffed and kicked? Aye, aye, so are you too. No matter, tis past. By the immortal thunder of great guns, tis false. He sucks not vital air who dares affirm it to this face. Looks big. To that face I grant you, Captain. No, no, I grant you. Not to that face, by the Lord Harry. If you had put on your fighting face before, you had done his business. He durst as soon have kissed you as kicked you to your face. But a man can no more help what's done behind his back than what's said. Come, we'll think no more of what's past. I'll call a council of war within to consider of my revenge to come. Scene 10 Hartwell, Sylvia. Sylvia's apartment. Song. As Amoret and Thysiris lay, Melting the hours in gentle play, Joining faces, mingling kisses, And exchanging harmless blisses, He trembling cried with eager haste, 
Oh, let me feed as well as taste. I die if I'm not wholly blessed. After the song, a dance of antics. Indeed, it is very fine. I could look upon him all day. Well, has this prevailed for me? And will you look upon me? If you could sing and dance so, I should love to look upon you too. Why, twas I sung and danced. I gave music to the voice and life to their measures. Look you here, Sylvia. Pulling out a purse and chinking it. Here are songs and dances, poetry and music. Hark, how sweetly one guinea rhymes to another, and how they dance to the music of their own chink. This buys all to other, and this thou shalt have. This and all that I am worth for the purchase of thy love. Say, is it mine then, huh? Speak, siren. Oh, why do I look upon her? Yet I must. Speak, dear angel, devil, saint, witch. Do not rack me with suspense. Nay, don't stare at me so. You make me blush. I cannot look. Oh, manhood, where art thou? What am I come to? A woman's toy at these years. Death, a bearded baby for a girl to dandle. Oh, dotage, dotage. That ebb of that noble passion, lust, should ebb to this degree. No reflux of vigorous blood, but milky love supplies the empty channels and prompts me to the softness of a child, a mere infant, and would suck. Can you love me, Sylvia? Speak. I dare not speak until I believe you, and indeed I'm afraid to believe you yet. Death, how her innocence torments and pleases me. Lying child is indeed the art of love, and men are generally masters in it. But I'm so newly entered, you cannot distrust me of any skill in the treacherous mystery. Now, by my soul, I cannot lie, though it were to serve a friend or gain a mistress. Must you lie, then, if you say you love me? No, no, dear ignorance, thou beauteous changeling. I tell thee I do love thee and tell it for a truth, a naked truth which I'm ashamed to discover. But love, they say, is a tender thing that will smooth frowns and make calm an angry face, will soften a rugged temper and make ill-humoured people good. You look ready to fright one and talk as if your passion were not love but anger. Tis both, for I am angry with myself when I am pleased with you and a pox upon me for loving thee so well. Yet I must on. Tis a bearded arrow, and will more easily be thrust forward than drawn back. Indeed, if I were well assured you loved. But how can I be well assured? Take the symptoms, and ask all the tyrants of thy sex if their fools are not known by this party-coloured livery. I am melancholic when thou art absent. Look like an ass when thou art present. Wake for thee when I should sleep, and even dream of thee when I am awake. Sigh much, drink little, eat less, court solitude, am grown very entertaining to myself, and, as I am informed, very troublesome to everybody else. If this be not love, it is madness, and then it is pardonable. Nay, yet a more certain sign than all this, I give thee my money. Ah, but that is no sign. 
for they say gentlemen will give money to any naughty woman to come to bed with them. Oh, Gemini, I hope you don't mean so, for I won't be a whore. Hartwell, aside. The more is the pity. Nay, if you would marry me, you should not come to bed to me. You have such a beard and would so prickle one. But do you intend to marry me? Hartwell, aside. That a fool should ask such a malicious question. Death, I shall be put in before I know where I am. However, I find I am pretty sure of her consent if I am put to it. Marry you? No, no, I'll love you. Nay, but if you love me, you must marry me. What, don't I know my father loved my mother and was married to her? Aye, aye, in old days people married where they loved. But that fashion is changed, child. Never tell me that. I know it is not changed by myself, for I love you and would marry you. I'll have my beard shaved, it shan't hurt thee, and we'll go to bed. No, no, I'm not such a fool neither, but I can keep myself honest. Here, I won't keep anything that's yours. I hate you now. Throws the purse. And I'll never see you again, cause you'd have me be naught. Going. Damn her, let her go, and a good riddance. Yet so much tenderness and beauty and honesty together is a jewel. Stay, Sylvia. But then to marry, why, every man plays the fool once in his life. But to marry is playing the fool all one's life long. What did you call me for? I'll give thee all I have, and thou shalt live with me in everything. So like my wife, the world shall believe it. Nay, thou shalt think so thyself. Only let me not think so. No, I'll die before I'll be your whore, as well as I love you. Hartwell, aside. A woman, an ignorant, may be honest, when tis out of obstinacy and contradiction. But a death. It is but a maybe, and upon scurvy terms. Well, farewell, then. If I can get out of sight, I may get the better of myself. Well, good-bye. Turns and weeps. Ah, oh, nay, come, we'll kiss at parting. Kisses her. By heaven, her kiss is sweeter than liberty. I will marry thee. There, thou hast done it. All oh, my resolves melted in that kiss. One more? But when? I am impatient till it be done. I will not give myself liberty to think, lest I should cool. I will about a license straight. In the evening expect me. One kiss more to confirm me mad, so? <laughs> An old fox trapped. Scene 11 to her, Lucy. Bless me, you frightened me. I thought he had been come again and had heard me. Lord, madam, I met your lover in as much haste as if he had been going for a midwife. He's going for a parson girl, the forerunner of a midwife some nine months hence. Well, I find dissembling to our sex is as natural as swimming to a negro. We may depend upon our skill to save us at a plunge, though till then we never make the experiment. But how hast thou succeeded? As you would wish, since there is no reclaiming vain love. I have found out a peak she has taken at him, and have framed a letter that makes her sue for reconciliation first. I know that will do. Walk in and I'll show it you. Come, madam. You're like to have a happy time on both your love and anger satisfied. All that can charm our sex conspire to please you. That woman sure enjoys a blessed night, whom love and vengeance both at once delight. End of Act 3 
Act Four of The Old Bachelor by William Congreve. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Four, Scene One. Scene The Street. Belmore in fanatic habit. Setter. Tis pretty near the hour. Looking on his watch. Well, and how, Setter, hey, does my hypocrisy fit me, hey? Does it sit easy on me? Oh, most religiously well, sir. I wonder why all our young fellows should glory in an opinion of atheism when they may be so much more conveniently lewd under the coverlet of religion. Spud, sir, away quickly. There's fondled wife just turned the corner and's coming this way. God, so there he is. He must not see me. Scene two, fondle wife, Barnaby. I say I will tarry at home. But, sir, good lack, I profess the spirit of contradiction hath possessed the lad. I say I will tarry at home, varlet. I have done, sir. Then farewell, five hundred pound. Ha, huh? how's that? stay stay did you leave word say you with his wife with comfort herself i did and comfort will send tribulation hither as soon as ever he comes home i could have brought young mr prig to have kept my mistress company in the meantime but you say how how say varlet i say let him not come near my doors i say he is a wanton young levite that pampereth himself up with dainties that he may look lovely in the eyes of women uh, sincerely i am afraid he hath already defiled the tabernacle of our sister comfort while her good husband is deluded by his godly appearance i say that even lust doth sparkle in his eyes and glow upon his cheeks and that i would as soon trust my wife with a lord's high-fed chaplain sir the hour draws nigh and nothing will be done here until you come and nothing can be done here until i go so that i'll tarry do you see and run the hazard to lose your affair sir good lack good lack i profess it is a very sufficient vexation for a man to have a handsome wife never sir but when the man is an insufficient husband tis then indeed like the vanity of taking a fine house and yet be forced to let lodgings to help pay the rent i profess a very apt comparison varlet go and bid my cocky come out to me i will give her some instructions i will reason with her before i go scene three fondle wife alone and in the meantime i will reason with myself uh, tell me isaac why art thee jealous why art thee distrustful of the wife of thy bosom because uh, she is young and vigorous and uh, i am old and impotent then why didst thee marry isaac because she was beautiful and tempting and because i was obstinate and doting so that my inclination was and is still greater than my power and will not that which tempted thee also tempt others who will tempt her isaac i fear it much uh, but does not thy wife love thee nay dote upon thee yes why then ay but to say truth she's fonder of me than she has reason to be and in the way of trade we still suspect the smoothest dealers of the deepest designs and that she has some designs deeper than thou canst reach thou hast experimented isaac but mum scene four fondle wife Letitia. I hope my dearest jewel is not going to leave me. Are you nicking? Wife, have you thoroughly considered how detestable, how heinous, and how crying a sin the sin of adultery is? Have you weighed it, I say? 
for it is a very weighty sin, and although it may lie heavy upon thee, yet thy husband must also bear his part, for thy iniquity will fall upon his head. Bless me, what means, my dear? Fondle wife, aside. I profess she has an alluring eye. I am doubtful whether I shall trust her, even with tribulation himself. Speak, I say. Have you considered what it is to cuckold your husband? Letitia, aside. I am amazed. Sure he has discovered nothing. Who has wronged me to my dearest? I hope my jewel does not think that ever I had any such thing in my head, or ever will have. No, no, I tell you, I shall have it in my head. Letitia, aside. I know not what to think, but I'm resolved to find the meaning of it. Unkind dear, was it for this you sent to call me? Is it not affliction enough that you are to leave me, but you must study to increase it by unjust suspicions? <laughs> well, well, you know my fondness, and you love to tyrannize. Go on, cruel man, do. Triumph over my poor heart while it holds, which cannot be long with this usage of yours. But that's what you want. Well, you will have your end soon. You will. You will. Yes, it will break to oblige you. <laughs> Fondle wife, aside. Verily, I fear I have carried the jest too far. Nay, look you now if she does not weep. Tis the fondest fool. Nay, cocky, cocky, nay, my dear cocky, don't cry. I was but in jest. I was not, I feck. Letitia, aside. Oh, then all is safe. I was terribly frighted. My affliction is always your jest, barbarous man. Oh, that I should love to this degree. Yet... Uh, nay, cocky. No, no, you are weary of me, that's it. That's all. You would get another wife. Another fond fool to break her heart. Well, be as cruel as you can to me. I'll pray for you. And when I am dead with grief... May you have one that will love you as well as I have done. I shall be contented to lie at peace in my cold grave, since it will please you. <laughs> Fondle wife, aside. A good lack, a good lack. She would melt a heart of oak. I profess I can hold no longer. Nay, dear cocky, I feck you'll break my heart. I feck you will. See, you have made me weep, made poor Neekin weep. And nay, come kiss bus poor Neekin, and I won't leave thee. I'll lose all first. Letitia, aside. How? Heaven forbid. That will be carrying the jest too far indeed. Won't you kiss Neekin? Go, naughty Neekin. You don't love me. Kiss, kiss, I feck I do. No, you don't. She kisses him. What, not love, Cocky? No. I profess I do love thee better than five hundred pound. And so thou shalt say, for I'll leave it to stay with thee. No, you shan't neglect your business for me. No, indeed, you shan't, Nikin. If you don't go, I'll think you've been jealous of me still. <laughs> with thou poor fool then i will go i won't be jealous the poor cocky kiss neekin kiss neekin he he here will be the good man anon to talk to cocky and teach her how a wife ought to behave herself letitia aside <sighs> I hope to have one that will show me how a husband ought to behave himself. I shall be glad to learn to please my jewel. Mm. Kiss. That's my good dear. Come kiss Nikon once more, 
and then get you in. So, get you in, get you in. Bye-bye. Bye, Nikin. Bye, Cocky. Bye, Nikin. Bye, Cocky. Bye-bye. Scene 5. Vain love sharper. How? Araminta lost? To confirm what I have said, read this. Gives the letter. Sharper reads. Hum, hum. And what then appeared a fault upon reflection seems only an effect of a too powerful passion. I am afraid I give it too great a proof of my own at this time. I am in disorder for what I have written, but something I know not what forced me. I only beg a favorable censure of this and your Araminta. Lost. Pray heaven thou hast not lost thy wits. Here, here, she's thine own, man, sign and sealed too. To her, man, a delicious melon, pure and consenting ripe, and only waits thy cutting up. She has been breeding love to thee all this while, and just now she's delivered of it. Tis an untimely fruit, and she has miscarried of her love. Never leave this damned ill nature whimsy, Frank. Thou hast a sickly, peevish appetite. Only chew love and cannot digest it. Yes, when I feed myself. But I hate to be crammed. By heaven, there's not a woman will give a man the pleasure of a chase. My sport is always balked or cut short. I stumble over the game I would pursue. Tis dull and unnatural to have a hair run full in the hound's mouth, and would distaste the keenest hunter. I would have overtaken, not have met my game. However, I hope you don't mean to forsake it. That will be but a kind of mongrel cur's trick. Well, are you for them all? No, she will be there this evening. Yes, I will go to, and she shall see her error in... In her choice, I gad. But thou canst not be so great a brute as to slight her. I should disappoint her if I did not. By her management, I should think she expects it. All naturally fly what does pursue. Tis fit men should be coy when women woo. Scene 6. A Room in Fondlewife's House A servant introducing Belmore, in fanatic habit, with a patch upon one eye, and a book in his hand. Here's a chair, sir, if you please to repose yourself. My mistress is coming, sir. Secure in my disguise, I have outfaced suspicion and even dared discovery. This cloak my sanctity, and trusty Scarron's novels my prayer book. Methinks I am the very picture of Montefar in the Hippocrates. Oh, she comes. Scene 7. Belmore, Letitia. So breaks Aurora through the veil of night. Thus fly the clouds divided by her light. And every eye receives a newborn sight. Throwing off his cloak, patch, etc. Thus stood with blushes like... <gasps> Heaven defend me! Who's this? Discovering him, starts. Your lover. Letitia, aside. Vain love's friend. I know his face, and he has betrayed me to him. You are surprised. Did you not expect a lover, madam? Those eyes shone kindly on my first appearance, though now they are o'ercast. I may well be surprised at your person and impudence. They are both new to me. You are not what your first appearance promised. The piety of your habit was welcome, but not the hypocrisy. Rather, the hypocrisy was welcome, but not the hypocrite. Who are you, sir? You have mistaken the house, sure. I have directions in my pocket which agree with everything but your unkindness. Pulls out the letter. Letitia, aside. My letter, base, vain love. <sighs> then tis too late to dissemble. <laughs> tis plain, then, you have mistaken the person. Going. If we part so, I'm mistaken. Hold, hold, madam. I confess I have run into an error. I beg your pardon a thousand times. What an eternal blockhead am I! Can you forgive me the disorder I have put you into? But it is a mistake which anybody might have made. Letitia, aside. 
what can this mean tis impossible he should be mistaken after all this a handsome fellow if he had not surprised me methinks now i look on him again i would not have him mistaken <laughs> we are all liable to mistakes sir if you own it to be so there needs no farther apology nay faith madam tis a pleasant one and worth your hearing expecting a friend last night at his lodgings till twas late my intimacy with him gave me the freedom of his bed he not coming home all night a letter was delivered to me by a servant in the morning upon the perusal i found the contents so charming that i could think of nothing all day but putting him in practice until just now the first time i ever looked upon the superscription i am the most surprised in the world to find it directed to mr vane love gad madam i ask you a million of pardons and will make you any satisfaction letitia aside i am discovered and either vain love is not guilty or he has handsomely excused him you appear concerned madam i hope you are a gentleman and since you are privy to a weak woman's failing won't turn it to the prejudice of her reputation you look as if you had more honour and more love or my face is a false witness and deserves to be pilloried no by heaven i swear nay don't swear if you'd have me believe you but promise well i promise a promise is so cold give me leave to swear by those eyes those killing eyes by those healing lips oh press the soft charm close to mine and seal em up for ever <laughs> upon that condition he kisses her eternity was in that moment one more upon any condition letitia aside nay now i never saw anything so agreeably impudent won't you censure me for this now but tis to buy your silence mm. kiss oh but what am i doing doing no tongue can express it not thy own nor anything but thy lips i am faint with the excess of bliss oh for love's sake lead me any whither where i may lie down quickly for i'm afraid i shall have a fit oh bless me what fit oh a convulsion i feel the symptoms does it hold you long i'm afraid to carry you into my chamber oh no let me lie down upon the bed the fit will be soon over scene eight scene st james's park araminta and belinda meeting lord my dear i am glad i have met you i have been at the exchange since and i am so tired why what's the matter oh the most inhuman barbarous hackney coach i am jolted to a jelly am i not horribly toosed pulls out a pocket glass your head's a little out of order a little a oh, frightful what a furious fizz i have a oh, most rueful <laughs> oh gad i hope nobody will come this way till i have put myself a little in repair ah my dear i have seen such unhewn creatures since <laughs> i can't for my soul help thinking that i look just like one of em good dear pin this and i'll tell you very well so thank you my dear but as i was telling pish this is the untowardest lock so as i was telling how do you like me now hideous ha huh? frightful still or how no no you're very well as can be and so but where did i leave off my dear i was telling you you were about to tell me something child but you left off before you began oh a most comical sight a country squire with the equipage of a wife and two daughters came to mrs snipwell's shop while i was there but oh gad two such unlicked cubs i warrant plump cherry-cheeked country girls i on my conscience fat as a barn-door fowl but so bedecked 
you would have taken them for Friesland hens, with their feathers growing the wrong way. Oh, such outlandish creatures, such tremontanae, and foreigners to the fashion, or anything in practice. I had not patience to behold. I undertook the modelling of one of their fronts, the more modern structure. Bless me, cousin. Why would you affront anybody so? They might be gentlewomen of a very good family. Of a very ancient one, I dare swear, by their dress. Affront? Pshaw! How you're mistaken. The poor creature, I warrant, was as full of curtsies as if I had been her godmother. The truth on it is, I did endeavour to make her look like a Christian. And she was sensible of it, for she thanked me, and gave me two apples piping hot out of her under-petticoat pocket. <laughs> and how that did so stare and goop, I fancied her like the front of her father's hall, her two eyes with the jut windows, and her mouth the great door, most hospitably kept open for the entertainment of travelling flies. So then, you have been diverted. What did they buy? Why, the father bought a powder horn and an almanac and a comb case, the mother a great frost tower and a fat ember necklace. The daughters only tore two pairs of kids' leather gloves worth trying them on. Oh, gad, here comes the fool that dined at my lady free loves t'other day. Scene nine. To them, Sir Joseph and Bluff. Maybe he may not know us again. We'll put our masks on to secure his ignorance. They put on their masks. Nay, Gad, I'll pick up. I'm resolved to make a night on't. I'll go to Alderman Fondlewife by and by and get fifty pieces more from him. Add Slidikins, bully, will wallow in wine and women. Why, this same Madeira wine has made me as light as a grasshopper. Hist, hist, bully, dost thou see those terrors? Sings. Look you what here is, look you what here is, tall lol, terra, tall lol. Agad, tell the glass of Madeira, and I durst have attacked him in my own proper person, without your help. Come on, then, knight. But do you know what to say to them? Say? Pooh, pox, I've enough to say, never fear it. That is, if I can but think on't, truth is, I have but a treacherous memory. Oh, frightful, cousin, what shall we do? These things come towards us. No matter. I see vain love coming this way. And, to confess my failing, I am willing to give him an opportunity of making his peace with me, and to rid me of these coxcombs, when I seem oppressed with them. Will be a fair one. Ladies, by these hilts you are well met. We are afraid not. Bluff to Belinda. What says my pretty little knapsack carrier? Oh, monstrous filthy fellow, good slovenly Captain Huff Bluff. What is your hideous name? Be gone, you stink of brandy and tobacco. Most soldier-like foe. Sir Joseph, aside. Now I'm slapdash down in the mouth and have not one word to say. Araminta, aside. I hope my fool has not confidence enough to be troublesome. Hem. Pray, madam, which way is the wind? A pithy question. Have you sent your wits for a venture, sir, that you inquire? Sir Joseph, aside. Nay, now I'm in. I can prattle like a magpie. Scene ten. To them, sharper and vain love at some distance. Dear Araminta, I'm tired. Tis but pulling off our masks and obliging vain love to know us. I'll be rid of my fool by fair means. Well, Sir Joseph, you shall see my face, but be gone immediately. I see one that will be jealous to find me in discourse with you. Be discreet. No reply, but away. Unmasks. Sir Joseph, aside. The great fortune that dined at my lady free loves. Sir Joseph, thou art a made man. Agad, I'm in love up to the ears. But I'll be discreet and hushed. Nay, by the world, I'll see your face. You shall. Unmasks. Ladies, your humble servant, we were afraid you would not have given us leave to know you. We thought to have been private. 
but we find fools have the same advantage over a face in a mask that a coward has while the sword is in the scabbard. So we're forced to draw in our own defense. Bluff to Sir Joseph. My blood rises at that fellow. I can't stay where he is, and I must not draw in the park. I wish I durst stay to let her know my lodging. Scene 11. Araminta, Belinda, Vainlove, Sharper. There is in true beauty, as in courage, somewhat which narrow souls cannot dare to admire. And see, the owls are fled as at the break of day. Very courtly. I believe Mr. Vainlove has not rubbed his eyes since break of day neither. He looks as if he durst not approach. Nay, come, cousin, be friends with him. I swear he looks so very simply. <laughs> well, a lover in the state of separation from his mistress is like a body without a soul. Mr. Vainlove, shall I be bound for your good behaviour for the future? Vainlove, aside. Now must I pretend ignorance equal to hers of what she knows as well as I. Men are apt to offend, tis true, where they find most goodness to forgive. But, madam, I hope I shall prove a temper not to abuse mercy by committing new offences. Araminta, aside. So cold. I have broke the ice for you, Mr. Vainlove, and so I leave you. Come, Mr. Sharper, you and I will take a turn and laugh at the vulgar, both great vulgar and small. Oh, gad, I have a great passion for Cowley. Don't you admire him? Oh, madam, he was our English Horace. Ah, oh, so fine, so extremely fine, so everything in the world that I like. Oh, Lord, walk this way. I see a couple. I'll give you their history. Scene 12. Araminta, Vainlove. I find, madam, the formality of the law must be observed, though the penalty of it be dispensed with, and an offender must plead to his arraignment, though he has his pardon in his pocket. I'm amazed. This insolence exceeds to other. Whoever has encouraged you to this assurance, presuming upon my easiness of temper, has much deceived you, and so you shall find. Vain love, aside. Heyday. Which way now? Here's fine doubling. Base man. Was it not enough to affront me with your saucy passion? You have given that passion a much kinder epithet than saucy in another place. Another place? Some villainous design to blast my honour. But thou hast all the treachery and malice of thy sex. Thou canst not lay a blemish on my fame. No, I have not erred in one favourable thought of mankind. How time might have deceived me in you I know not. My opinion was but young, and your early baseness has prevented its growing to a wrong belief. Unworthy and ungrateful, be gone and never see me more. Did I dream, or do I dream? Should I believe my eyes or ears? The vision is here still. Your passion, madam, will admit of no farther reasoning. But here's a silent witness of your acquaintance. Takes out the letter and offers it. She snatches it and throws it away. There's poison in everything you touch. Blisters will follow. That tongue which denies what the hands have done. Still mystically senseless and impudent. I find I must leave this place. No, madam, I'm gone. She knows her names to it, which she will be unwilling to expose to the censure of the first finder. Woman's obstinacy made me blind to what woman's curiosity now tempts me to see. Takes up the letter. Scene 13. Belinda Sharper. Nay, we have spared nobody, I swear. Mr. Sharper, you're a pure man. Where did you get this excellent talent of railing? Faith, madam, the talent was born with me. I confess I have taken care to improve it, to qualify me for the society of ladies. Nay, sure, railing is the best qualification in a woman's man. Scene 14. To them, footman. The second best indeed, I think. How now, Pace, where's my cousin? She's not very well, madam, and is sent to know if your ladyship would have the coach come again for you. Oh, Lord, no, I'll go along with her. Come, Mr. Sharper. Scene 15. Scene, a chamber in Fondlewife's house. Letitia and Belmore, his cloak, hat, etc., 
lying loose about the chamber. Here's nobody, or no noise. Twas nothing but your fears. <sighs> I durst have sworn I had heard my monster's voice. I swear I was heartily frightened. <sighs> Feel how my heart beats. Tis an alarm to love. Come in again and let us... Fondle wife, without. Kaki, Kaki, where are you, Kaki? I'm come home. Oh, there he is. Make haste. Gather up your things. Kaki, Kaki, open the door. Pox, choke him when his horns were in his throat. My patch, my patch. Looking about and gathering up his things. My jewel, art thou there? No matter for your patch. You santum in Nikin. Run into my chamber, quickly, quickly. You sent them in. Nay, prithee, dear, I feck I am in haste. <sighs> then I'll let you in. Opens the door. Scene 16. Letitia, fondle wife, Sir Joseph. Kiss, dear. I met the master of the ship, by the way, and I must have my papers of accounts out of your cabinet. Letitia, aside. I'm undone. Pray, first let me have fifty pound, good alderman, for I am in haste. A hundred has already been paid by your order. Fifty? I have the sum ready in gold in my closet. Scene 17. Letitia, Sir Joseph. A cat. It's a curious, fine, pretty rogue. I'll speak to her. Pray, madam, what news do you hear? Sir... I seldom stir abroad. Walks about in disorder. I wonder at that, madam, for tis most curious fine weather. Methinks tis been very ill weather. As you say, madam, tis pretty bad weather, and has been so a great while. Scene 18. To them, fondle wife. Here are fifty pieces in this purse, Sir Joseph. If you will tarry a moment till I fetch my papers, I'll wait upon you downstairs. Letitia, aside. Ruined past redemption. What shall I do? <laughs> this fool may be of use. As Fondle Wife is going into the chamber, she runs to Sir Joseph, almost pushes him down, and cries out. Stand off, rude ruffian. Help me, my dear. Oh, bless me! Why will you leave me alone with such a satyr? Oh, bless us! Uh, what's the matter? What's the matter? Your back was no sooner turned, but like a lion he came open-mouthed upon me, and would have ravished a kiss from me by main force. Oh, Lord! Oh, terrible! Ha! 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 Is your wife mad, Alderman? Oh, I'm sick with the fright! Won't you take him out of my sight? Oh, traitor! I'm astonished, old bloody-minded traitor! Hey, day! Traitor yourself! By the Lord Harry, I was in most danger of being ravished, if you go to that! Oh, how the blasphemous wretch swears! Out of my house, thou son of the whore of Babylon! Offspring of Bell and the dragon! Bless us, ravish my wife, my Dinah. Oh, Shechemite, be gone, I say. Why, the devil's in the people, I think. Scene 19. Letitia, fondle wife. Oh, won't you follow and see him out of doors, my dear? I'll shut this door to secure him from coming back. Give me the key of your cabinet, cocky. Ravish my wife before my face. I warrant he's a papist in his heart, at least, if not a Frenchman. Letitia, aside. What can I do now? Oh, my dear, I have been in such a fright that I forgot to tell you. Poor Mr. Spintext has a sad fit of the colic and is forced to lie down upon our bed. You'll disturb him. I can tread softly. Alack, poor man, no. No, you don't know the papers. 
I, I won't disturb him. Give me the key. She gives him the key, goes to the chamber door, and speaks aloud. Tis nobody but Mr. Fondlewife, Mr. Spintext. Lie still on your stomach. Lying on your stomach will ease you of the colic. Ay, ay, lie still. Lie still. Don't let me disturb you. Scene 20. Letitia alone. Sure, when he does not see his face, he won't discover him. Oh, dear fortune, help me but this once, and I'll never run into thy debt again. But this opportunity is the devil. Scene 21. Fondlewife returns with papers. Good lack, good lack, I profess the poor man is in great torment. He lies as flat. Dear, you should heat a trencher or a napkin. Where's Deborah? Let her clap some warm thing to his stomach, or chafe it with a warm hand rather than fail. What book's this? Seize the book that Belmore forgot. <gasps> Mr. Spintex's prayer book, dear. Aside. Pray heaven it be a prayer book. Good man, I warrant he dropped it on purpose, that you might take it up and read some of the pious ejaculations. Taking up the book. Oh, bless me, oh, monstrous! A prayer book? Ay, this is the devil's paternoster. Hold, let me see, the innocent adultery. Letitia, aside. Misfortune, now all's ruined again. Belmore, peeping. Damned chance! If I had gone a-whoring with the practice of piety in my pocket, I had never been discovered. Adultery and innocent? Oh, Lord! Here's doctrine. Aye, here's discipline. Dear husband, I'm amazed. Sure, it is a good book, and only tends to the speculation of sin. Speculation? No, no, something went farther than speculation when I was not to be let in. Where is this apocryphal elder? I'll ferret him. Letitia, aside. <laughs> I'm so distracted I can't think of a lie. Scene 22. Letitia and Fondlewife hailing out Belmore. Come out here, thou Ananias incarnate. Who? Oh, how now? Who have we here? Ho, 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 thou salacious woman. Am I then brutified? Hi, I feel it here. I sprout, I bud, I blossom, I am ripe horn mad. But who in the devil's name are you? Mercy on me for swearing, but... <gasps> Goodness keep us! Who are you? What are you? So... In the name of the... Oh, good, my dear, don't come near it. I'm afraid this the devil. Indeed, it has hoofs, dear. Indeed, I have horns, dear. The devil? No. I'm afraid tis the flesh, thou harlot. Dear, with the pox. Come, siren, speak, confess. Who is this reverend brawny pastor? Indeed, and indeed now, my dear Nikin. I never saw this wicked man before. Oh, it is a man, then, it seems. Rather, sure it is a wolf in the clothing of a sheep. Thou art a devil in his proper clothing. Woman's flesh. What, you know nothing of him but his fleece here? You don't love mutton, you Magdalen unconverted. Belmore, aside, well, now I know my cue, that is, very honorably to excuse her, and very impudently accuse myself. Why, then, I wish I may never enter into the heaven of your embraces again, my dear, if ever I saw his face before. Oh, Lord, oh, strange, I am in admiration of your impudence. Look at him a little better. He is more modest, I warrant you, than to deny it. Come, were you two never face to face before? Speak.
speak, since all artifice is vain, and I think myself obliged to speak the truth and justice to your wife. No. <laughs> no, indeed, dear. Nay, I find you are both in a story, that I must confess. But what, not to be cured of the colic? Don't you know your patient, Mrs. Quack? Oh, lie upon your stomach. Lying upon your stomach will cure you of the colic. Ah, answer me, Jezebel. <laughs> Let the wicked man answer for himself. Does he think I have nothing to do but excuse him? Tis enough if I can clear my own innocence to my own dear. By my troth, and so it is. I have been a little too backward. That's the truth on it. Come, sir, who are you in the first place? And what are you? A whore-master. Very concise. Oh, beastly, impudent creature. Well, sir, and what came you hither for? To lie with your wife. Good again. A very civil person, this, and I believe speaks truth. Oh, insupportable impudence. Well, sir, pray be covered. And you have, eh? You have finished the matter, eh? And I am, as I should be, a sort of civil prerequisite to a whore-master called a cuckold, eh? Is it not so? Come, I'm inclining to believe every word you say. Why, faith, I must confess, so I designed you. But you were a little unlucky in coming so soon, and hindered the making of your own fortune. Ha, <laughs> hum, nay. If you miss the matter once and go back of your word, you are not the person I took you for. Come, come, go on boldly. What, don't be ashamed of your profession? Confess, confess. I shall love thee better for it. I shall, I feck. What, dost think I don't know how to behave myself in the employment of a cuckold, and have been three years apprentice to matrimony? Come, come, plain dealing is a jewel. Well, since I see thou art a good, honest fellow, I'll confess the whole matter to thee. Oh, I am a very honest fellow. You never lay with an honester man's wife in your life. Letitia aside. Oh, how my heart aches. All my comfort lies in his impudence, and heaven be praised, he has a considerable portion. In short, then, I was informed of the opportunity of your absence by my spy. For faith, honest Isaac, I have a long time designed thee this favour. I knew Spintext was to come by your direction. But I laid a trap for him and procured his habit, in which I passed upon your servants and was conducted hither. I pretended a fit of the colic to excuse my lying down upon your bed, hoping that when she heard of it, her good nature would bring her to administer remedies for my distemper. You know what might have followed. But, like an uncivil person, you knocked at the door before your wife has come to me. Ha, <laughs> ha, this is apocryphal. I may choose whether I will believe it or no. That you may, faith, and I hope you won't believe a word on it. But I can't help telling the truth for my life. How? Would not you have me believe you, say you? No, for then you must of consequence part with your wife, and there will be some hopes of having her upon the public. Then the encouragement of a separate maintenance. No, no, for that matter, when she and I part, she'll carry her separate maintenance about her. Oh, cruel, dear, how can you be so barbarous? You'll break my heart if you talk of parting. <laughs> Cries. Ha! Dissembling vermin! How canst thou be so cruel, Isaac? Thou hast the heart of a mountain tiger. By the faith of a sincere sinner, she's innocent for me. Go to him, madam. Fling your snowy arms about his stubborn neck. Bathe his relentless face in your salt-trickling tears. She goes and hangs upon his neck and kisses him. Belmore kisses her hand behind Fondlewife's back. 
So, a few soft words and a kiss, and the good man melts. See how kind nature works and boils over in him. Indeed, my dear, I was but just come downstairs when you knocked at the door, and the maid told me Mr. Spintex was ill of the colic upon our bed. And won't you speak to me, cruel Nikin? Indeed, I'll die if you don't. Ah, no, no, I cannot speak. My heart's so full. I have been a tender husband, a tender yoke fellow. You know I have. But thou hast been a faithless Delilah, and the Philistines, eh? Eh, art thou not vile and unclean, eh? Speak. Weeping. No. <laughs> oh, that I could believe thee. Oh, my heart will break. <laughs> Seeming to faint. Hey, how? No, stay. Stay, I will believe thee. I will. Pray bend her forward, sir. Oh, oh, where is my dear? Here, here, I do believe thee. I won't believe my eyes. For my part, I am so charmed with the love of your turtle to you that I'll go and solicit matrimony with all my might and main. Well, well, sir, as long as I believe it, tis well enough. No thanks to you, sir, for her virtue. But I'll show you the way out of my house, if you please. Come, my dear. Nay, I will believe thee. I do, I feck. See the great blessing of an easy faith. Opinion cannot err. No husband by his wife can be deceived. She still is virtuous, if she's so believed. End of Act Four Act Five of The Old Bachelor by William Congreve. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Five, Scene One. Scene The Street. Belmore in fanatic habit, Setter, Hartwell, Lucy. Setter, well encountered. Joy of your return, sir. Have you made a good voyage, or have you brought your own lading back? No, I have brought nothing but ballast back. Made a delicious voyage, Setter, and might have rowed at anchor in the port till this time, but the enemy surprised us. I would unrig. I attend you, sir. Ha! Is it not that Hartwell at Sylvia's door? Be gone quickly, I'll follow you. I would not be known. Pox take them, they stand just in my way. Scene two. Belmore, Hartwell, Lucy. I'm impatient till it be done. That may be, without troubling yourself to go again for your brother's chaplain. Don't you see that stocking form of godliness? Oh, I. He's a fanatic. An executioner qualified to do your business. He has been lawfully ordained. I'll pay him well, if you'll break the matter to him. I warrant you. Do you go and prepare your bride? Scene 3. Belmore, Lucy. Oof, sits the wind there? What a lucky rogue am I! Oh, what sport will be here if I can persuade this wench to secrecy! Sir? Reverend sir? Madam! Discovers himself. Now, goodness have mercy upon me! Mr. Belmower, is it you? Even I! What dost think? Think? That I should not believe my eyes, and that you are not what you seem to be. True, but to convince thee who I am, thou knowest my old token. Mwah. Kisses her. Nay, Mr. Belmower. Oh, lard, I believe you are a parson in good earnest. You kiss so devoutly. 
Well, your business with me, Lucy? I had none, but through mistake. Which mistake you must go through with, Lucy? Come, I know the intrigue between Hartwell and your mistress, and you mistook me for tribulation spintext to marry him, huh? Are not matters in this posture? Confess. Come, I'll be faithful. I will, I faith. What? Defied in me, Lucy? Alas a day! You and Mr. Vainlove, between you, have ruined my poor mistress. You have made a gap in her reputation. And can you blame her if she make it up with a husband? Well, is it as I say? Well, it is then. But you'll be secret? Oh, secret, ay, and to be out of thy debt I'll trust thee with another secret. Your mistress must not marry Hartwell, Lucy. How? Oh, Lord! Nay, don't be in passion, Lucy. I'll provide a fitter husband for her. Come, here's earnest of my good intentions for thee, too. Let this mollify. Give some money. Look, you. Hartwell is my friend, and though he be blind, I must not see him fall into the snare and unwittingly marry a whore. Whore? I'd have you to know my mistress scorns. Nay, nay. Look you, Lucy, there are whores of as good quality. But to the purpose, if you will give me leave to acquaint you with it. Do you carry on the mistake of me? I'll marry him. Nay, don't pause. If you do, I'll spoil all. I have some private reasons for what I do, which I'll tell you within. In the meantime, I promise, and rely upon me, to help your mistress to a husband. Nay, and thee too, Lucy. Here's my hand, I will, with a fresh assurance. Give some more money. Ah, uh, the devil is not so cunning. You know my easy nature. Well, for once I'll venture to serve you, but if you do deceive me, the curse of all kind, tender-hearted women light upon you. That's as much to say the pox take me. Well, lead on. Scene 4. Vainlove, Sharper, and Setter Just now, say you, gone in with Lucy? I saw him, sir and stood at the corner where you found me, and overheard all they said. Mr. Belmore is to marry him. Ha <laughs> ha, it will be a pleasant cheat. I'll play Cartwell when I see him. Prithee, Frank, let's tease him. Make him fret till he foam at the mouth and disgorge his matrimonial oath with interest. Come thou art musty. Setter to Sharper. Sir, a word with you. Whispers him. Sharper swears she has forsworn the letter, and the shade tells me truth, but I am not sure she told him truth. Yet she was unaffectedly concerned, he says, and often blushed with anger and surprise. And so I remember in the park, she had reason if I wrong her. I begin to doubt. Sayest thou so? This afternoon, sir, about an hour before my master received the letter. In my conscience, like enough. Ay, I know her, sir. At least I'm sure I can fish it out of her. She's the very sluice of her lady's secrets. Tis but setting her mill a-going, and I can drain her of em all. Here, Frank, your bloodhound has made out the fault. This letter, that so sticks in thy maw, is counterfeit. Only a trick of Sylvia in revenge, contrived by Lucy. Ha! Huh. It has a colour. But how do you know it, Sirrah? I do suspect as much, because why, sir, she was pumping me about how your worship's affairs stood towards Madame Araminta, as when you had seen her last, when you were to see her next, and where you were to be found at that time, and such like. And where did you tell her? In the piazza. There I received the letter. It must be so. And why did you not find me out to tell me this before, Sot? Sir, I was pimping for Mr. Belmore. You were well employed. I think there is no objection to the excuse. Pox of my saucy credulity. 
If I have lost her, I deserve it. But if confession and repentance be a force, I'll win her, or weary her into a forgiveness. Methinks I long to see Belmore come forth. Scene 5. Sharper Belmore Setter. Talk of the devil, see where he comes. Hugging himself in his prosperous mischief, no real fanatic can look better pleased after a successful sermon of sedition. Sharper, fortify thy spleen, such a jest. Speak when thou art ready. Now, were I ill-natured, would I utterly disappoint thy mirth. Hear thee tell thy mighty jest with as much gravity as a bishop hears venereal causes in the spiritual court. Not so much as wrinkle my face with one smile, but let thee look simply and laugh by thyself. Pshaw, no. I have better opinion of thy wit. God, I defy thee. Were it not loss of time, you should make the experiment. But honest setter here overheard you with Lucy, and has told me all. Nay, then, I thank thee for not putting me out of countenance. But to tell you something you don't know. I got an opportunity after I had married him of discovering the cheat to Sylvia. She took it at first, as another woman would the like disappointment, but my promise to make her amends quickly with another husband somewhat pacified her. But how the devil do you think to acquit yourself of your promise? Will you marry her yourself? I have no such intentions at present. Prithee, wilt thou think a little for me? I am sure the ingenious Mr. Setter will assist. Oh, Lord, sir. I'll leave him with you and go shift my habit. Scene 6. Sharper, Setter, Sir Joseph, and Bluff. Heh. <laughs> sure fortune has sent this fool hither on purpose. Setter, stand close, seem not to observe him, and hark ye. Whispers. Fear him not. I am prepared for him now, and he shall find he might have safe aroused a sleeping lion. Hush, hush, don't you see him? Show him to me, where is he? Nay, don't speak so loud, I don't jest as I did a little while ago. Look yonder, a gad if he should hear the lion roar, he'd cudgel him into an ass and his primitive brain. Don't you remember the story in Aesop's Fables, Bully? A gad, there are good morals to be picked out of Aesop's Fables. Let me tell you that, and Reynard the Fox, too. Damn your morals. Prithee, don't speak so loud. Damn your morals. I must revenge the affront done to my honour. Aye, do, do, Captain, if you think it fitting. You may dispose of your own flesh as you think fitting, do you see? But, by the Lord Harry, I'll leave you. Stealing away upon his tiptoes. Prodigious! What, will you forsake your friend in extremity? You can't in honour refuse to carry him a challenge. Almost whispering and treading softly after him. Prithee, what do you see in my face that looks as if I could carry a challenge? Honour is your province, Captain. Take it. All the world know me to be a knight and a man of worship. I warrant you, sir, I'm instructed. Sharper, aloud. Impossible. Araminta, take a liking to a fool? Her head runs with nothing else, nor she can talk of nothing else. I know she commanded him all the while we were in the park, but I thought it had been only to make vain love jealous. How's this? Good bully, hold your breath and let's hearken. Agad, this must be I. Death it can't be. An oaf, an idiot, a whittle. Aye, now it's out. Tis I, my own individual person. A wretch that has flown for shelter to the lowest shrub of mankind and seeks protection from a blasted coward. That's you, bully back. Bluff frowns upon Sir Joseph. Sharper to Setter. She has given Vainlove her promise to marry him before tomorrow morning, has she not? She has, sir. And I have it in charge to attend her all this evening, in order to conduct her to the place appointed. Well, I'll go and inform your master, and do you press her to make all the haste imaginable. Scene 7. Setter, Sir Joseph, Bluff. Were I a rogue now, what a noble prize could I dispose of? A goodly pinnace, richly laden, and to launch forth under my auspicious convoy. 
twelve thousand pounds and all her rigging besides what lies concealed under ashes ah all this committed to my care avaunt temptation setter show thyself a person of worth be true to thy trust and be reputed honest reputed honest mm, is that all ay for to be honest is nothing the reputation of it is all reputation what have such poor rogues as i to do with reputation tis above us and for men of quality they are above it so that reputation is even as foolish a thing as honesty and for my part if i meet sir joseph with a purse of gold in his hand i'll dispose of mine to the best advantage <laughs> here tis for you if faith mr setter nay i'll take you at your word chinking a purse sir joseph and the captain too undone undone i'm undone my master's undone my lady's undone and all the business is undone no no never fear man the lady's business shall be done what come mr setter i have overheard all and to speak is but loss of time and if there be occasion let these worthy gentlemen intercede for me gives him gold oh lord sir what do you mean corrupt my honesty they have indeed very persuading faces but tis too little there's more man there take all now well sir joseph you have such a winning way with you and how and how good setter did the little rogue look when she talked of sir joseph did not her eyes twinkle and her mouth water did not she pull up her little bubbies and agad i'm so overjoyed and stroked down her belly and then step aside to tie her garter when she was thinking of her love hey setter oh yes sir how now bully what melancholy because i'm in the lady's favour no matter i'll make your peace i know they were a little smart upon you but i warrant i'll bring you into the lady's good graces Sha! i have petitions to show from other guest toys than she look here these were sent me this morning there read shows letters that that's a scrawl of quality here here's from a countess too hum no hold that's from a knight's wife she sent it me by her husband but here both these are from persons of great quality they are either from persons of great quality or no quality at all to such a damned ugly hand while sir joseph reads bluff whispers setter captain i would do anything to serve you but this is so difficult not at all don't i know him you'll remember the conditions i'll give you it under my hand in the meantime here's ernest gives him money come knight i'm capitulating with mr setter for you an honest setter sirrah i'll give thee anything but a knight's lodging scene eight sharper tugging in hartwell nay prithee leave railing and come along with me maybe she mayn't be within tis but to yond corner house whether whether which corner house why there the two white posts and who would you visit there say you Ons, how my heart aches pshaw thou art so troublesome and inquisitive my i tell you tis a young creature that vain love debauched and has forsaken did you never hear Belmore chide him about Sylvia? Hartwell, aside. Death and hell and marriage. My wife? Why, thou art as musty as a new married man that had found his wife knowing the first night. Hartwell, aside. Hell and the devil. Does he know it? But hold, if he should not, I were a fool to discover it. I'll dissemble and try him. <laughs> why tom 
Is that such an occasion of melancholy? Is it such an uncommon mischief? No, Faith, I believe not. Few women but have their year of probation before they are cloistered in the narrow joys of wedlock. But prithee, come along with me, or I'll go and have the lady to myself. Bye bye, George. Going. Oh, torture. How he racks and tears me. Death. Shall I own my shame, or wittingly let him go and whore my life? No, that's insupportable. Oh, sharper. How now? Oh, uh, I am married. Now hold, spleen. Married? Certainly. Irrecoverably married. Heaven forbid, man. How long? Oh, an age, an age. I have been married um, these two hours. My old bachelor married? That were a jest. <laughs> so death, do ye mock me? Hark ye, if either you esteem my friendship or your own safety, come not near that house, that corner house, that hot brothel. Ask no questions. Mad by this light, thus grief still treads upon the heels of pleasure. Married in haste, we may repent at leisure. Scene 9. Sharper Setter Some by experience find these words misplaced. At leisure married, they repent in haste. As I suppose my master heart will. Here again, my Mercury. Sublimate, if you please, sir. I think my achievements do deserve the epithet. Mercury was a pimp, too. But though I blush to own it, at this time I must confess I am somewhat fallen from the dignity of my function, and do condescend to be scandalously employed in the promotion of vulgar matrimony. As how, dear dexterous pimp? Why, do be brief, for I have weighty affairs depending. Our stratagem succeeded as you intended. Bluff turns errant traitor, bribes me to make a private conveyance of the lady to him, and puts a shame settlement upon Sir Joseph. Oh, rogue. Well, but I hope. No, no. Never fear me, sir. I privately inform the knight of the treachery, who has agreed seemingly to be cheated, that the captain may be so in reality. Where's the bride? Shifting clothes for the purpose of friend's house of mine. Is company come in? If you'll walk this way, sir, I'll tell you. Scene 10. Belmore, Belinda, Araminta, and Vainlove. Vainlove to Araminta. Oh, twas frenzy all. Cannot you forgive it? Men in madness have a title to your pity. Which they forfeit when they are restored to their senses. I am not presuming beyond a pardon. You, who could reproach me with one counterfeit, how insolent would a real pardon make you? But there's no need to forgive what is not worth my anger. Belinda to Belmore. On my conscience, I could find in my heart to marry thee purely to be rid of thee. At least thou art so troublesome a lover, there's hopes thou'lt make a more than ordinary quiet husband. Say you so? Is that a maxim among ye? Yes, you fluttering men of the mode have made marriage a mere French dish. Belmore, aside. I hope there's no French sauce. <laughs> you are so curious in the preparation, that is, your courtship. One would think you meant a noble entertainment. But when we come to feed, tis all froth and poor, but in show. They often only remains, which have been I know not how many times warmed for other company, but at last served up cold to the wife. That were a miserable wretch indeed, who could not afford one warm dish for the wife of his bosom. But you timorous virgins form a dreadful chimera of a husband, as of a creature contrary to that soft, 
humble, pliant, easy thing, a lover. So guess at plagues and matrimony in opposition to the pleasures of courtship. Alas, courtship to marriage is but as the music in the playhouse, until the curtain's drawn, but that once up then opens the scene of pleasure. Oh, oh no! Rather courtship to marriage as a very witty prologue to a very dull play. Scene 11. To them, sharper. Hist, Belmore. If you'll bring the ladies, make haste to Sylvia's lodgings before Hartwell has fretted himself out of breath. Belmore, to Belinda. You have an opportunity now, madam, to revenge yourself upon Hartwell for affronting your squirrel. Oh, the filthy rude beast. Tis a lasting quarrel. I think he has never been at our house since. But give yourselves the trouble to walk to that corner house, and I'll tell you, by the way, what may divert and surprise you. Scene 12. Scene, Sylvia's Lodgings. Hartwell and Boy. Gone forth, say you, with her maid? There was a man, too, that fetched them out. Satter, I think they called him. So, that precious pimp, too. Damned, damned strumpet. Could she not contain herself on her wedding day? Not hold out till night? Oh, cursed state, how wide we err when apprehensive of the load of life. We hope to find that help which nature meant in womankind, to man that supplemental self-designed, but proves a burning caustic when applied. And Adam, sure, could with more ease abide, the bone when broken than when made a bride. Scene 13. To them, Belmore, Belinda, Vainlove, Araminta. Now, George, what rhyming! I thought the chimes of verse were past when once the doleful marriage knell was rung. Shame and confusion! I am exposed! Vainlove and Araminta talk apart. Joy, joy, Mr. Bridegroom, I give you joy, sir. Tis not in thy nature to give me joy. A woman can as soon give immortality. <laughs> oh, gad, men grow such clowns when they are married. That they are fit for no company but their wives. Nor for them neither in a little time. I swear at month's end you shall hardly find a married man that will do a civil thing to his wife or say a civil thing to anybody else. How he looks already! <laughs> <laughs> Death, am I made your laughing stock? For you, sir, I shall find a time. But take off your wasp there, or the clown may grow boisterous. I have a fly flap. You have occasion for it. Your wife has been blown upon. Oh, that's home. Not fiends or furies could have added to my vexation. Or anything but another woman. You've racked my patience. Be gone, or by... Hold, hold. What the devil? Thou wilt not draw upon a woman. What's the matter? Bless me. What have you done to him? He only touched a gold beast until he winced. Belmore, give it over. You vex him too much. Tis all serious to him. Nay, I swear, I begin to pity him myself. Damn your pity. But let me be calm a little. How have I deserved this of you? Any of ye? Sir, have I impaired the honour of your house? Promised your sister marriage and hoard her? Wherein have I injured you? Did I bring a physician to your father when he lay expiring and endeavour to prolong his life? And you, one and twenty? Madam, have I had an opportunity with you, and balked it? Did you ever offer me the favour that I refused it? Or... Oh, foe! What does the filthy fellow mean? Lord, let me be gone. Hang me if I pity you. You are right enough served. This is a little scurrilous, though. Nay, it is a sore of your own scratching. Well, George... 
you are the principal cause of all my present ills. If Sylvia had not been your mistress, my wife might have been honest. And if Sylvia had not been your wife, my mistress might have been just. There, we are even. But have a good heart. I heard of your misfortune, and come to your relief. When execution's over, you offer a reprieve. What would you give? Oh, anything, everything. A leg or two, or an arm. Nay, I would be divorced from my virility to be divorced from my wife. Scene 14. To them, sharper. Faith, that's a sure way. But here's one can sell you freedom better cheap. Vain love, I have been a kind of godfather to you yonder. I've promised and vowed some things in your name which I think you are bound to perform. No signing to a blank, friend. No, I'll deal fairly with you. Tis a full and free discharge to Sir Joseph Whittle and Captain Bluff for all injuries whatsoever done unto you by them until the present date hereof. How say you? Agreed. Then let me beg these ladies to wear their masks a moment. Come in, gentlemen and ladies. What the devil's all this to me? Patience. Scene the last. To them, Sir Joseph, Bluff, Sylvia, Lucy, Setter. All injuries whatsoever, Mr. Sharper. Aye, aye, whatsoever. Captain, stick to that, whatsoever. Tis done. These gentlemen are witnesses to the general release. Aye, aye, to this instant moment. I have passed an act of oblivion. Tis very generous, sir, since I needs must my own. No, no, Captain, you need not own. <laughs> Tis I must own. That you are overreached, too. <laughs> Only a little art military used. Only undermined. Or so. As shall appear by my fair Araminta, my wife's permission. Oh, the devil cheated at last. Lucy unmasks. Only a little art military trick, Captain. Only countermind or so. Mr. Vainlove, I suppose you know whom I have got now, but all's forgiven. I know whom you have not got. Pray, ladies, convince him. Araminta and Belinda unmask. Ah, oh, Lord, my heart aches. Ah, set her a rogue of all sides. Sir Joseph, you had better have pre-engaged this gentleman's pardon, for though vain love be so generous to forgive the loss of his mistress, I know not how Hartwell may take the loss of his wife. Sylvia unmasks. My wife? By this light tis she, the very cockatrice. Oh, sharper! Let me embrace thee. But art thou sure she is really married to him? Really and lawfully married. I am witness. Belmore will unriddle you. Hartwell goes to Belmore. Pray, madam, who are you? For I find you and I are like to be better acquainted. The worst of me is that I am your wife. Come, Sir Joseph, your fortune is not so bad as you fear. A fine lady, and a lady of very good quality. Thanks to my knighthood, she's a lady. That deserves a fool with a better title. Pray use her as my relation, or you shall hear on't. What, are you a woman of quality too, spouse? And my relation. Pray let her be respected accordingly. Well, honest Lucy, fare thee well. I think you and I have been playfellows on and off any time this seven year. Hold your prating. I'm thinking what vocation I shall follow while my spouse is planting laurels in the wars. No more wars, spouse. No more wars. While I plant laurels for my head abroad, I may find the branches sprout at home. Belmore, I approve thy mirth and thank thee. And I cannot in gratitude, for I see which way thou art going, see thee fall into the same snare out of which thou hast delivered me. I thank thee, George, for thy good intention. But there is a fatality in marriage, for I find I'm resolute. Then good counsel will be thrown away upon you. 
For my part, I have once escaped. And when I wed again, may she be ugly as an old bard. Ill-natured as an old maid. Wanton as a young widow. And jealous as a barren wife. Agreed. Well, midst of these dreadful denunciations, and notwithstanding the warning and example before me, I commit myself to lasting durance. Prisoner, make much of your fetters. Giving her hand. Frank, will you keep us in countenance? May I presume to hope so great a blessing? We had better take the advantage of a little of our friend's experience first. Belmore, aside. Oh, my conscience, she dares not consent, for fear he should recant. Well, we should have your company to church in the morning. Maybe it may get you an appetite to see us fall to before you. Setter, did not you tell me? They're at the door. I'll call them in. A dance. Now set we forward on a journey for life. Come take your fellow travellers. Old George, I'm sorry to see thee still plod on alone. With gaudy plumes and jingling bells made proud, the youthful beast sets forth and neighs aloud. A morning sun his tinseled harness gilds, and the first stage a downhill greensward yields. But oh, what rugged ways attend the noon of life! Our sun declines, and with what anxious strife, what pain we tug that galling load, a wife. All courses the first heat with vigor run, but tis with whip and spur the race is won. Exeunt omnes. End of Act Five. Epilogue, spoken by Mrs. Barry. As a rash girl, who will all hazards run, and be enjoyed, though sure to be undone, soon as her curiosity is over, would give the world she could her toy recover, so fares it with our poet, and I am sent to tell you he already does repent. <laughs> would you were all as forward to keep Lent? now the deed's done the giddy thing has leisure to think of the sting that's in the tale of pleasure methinks i hear him in consideration what will the world say where's my reputation now that's at stake <laughs> no fool tis out of fashion if loss of that should follow want of wit how many undone men were in the pit why that's some comfort to an author's fears. If he's an ass, he will be tried by his peers. But hold, I am exceeding my commission. My business here was humbly to petition. But we're so used to rail on these occasions, I could not help one trial of your patience. For this our way, you know, for fear of the worst, to be beforehand still and cry fool first. How say you, Sparks? How do you stand affected? I swear young Bayes within is so dejected t'would grieve your hearts to see him. Shall I call him? But then you cruel critics would so maul him. Yet maybe you'll encourage a beginner. But how? Just as the devil does a sinner. Women and wits are used even much at one. You gain your end, and damn em when you've done. End of The Old Bachelor by William Congreve